on Council. It is Monday, December 13th, 2010. And before we move on to the roll call and our regular agenda, the uh, oaths of office for newly elected town officials would be, will be administered by the town clerk, Deborah Lane. I'd like to welcome everybody here and proceed onward with the oaths. Thank you very much. Well, we'll begin with the school board members elect, which is Kimberly Monahan Dereg and Michael Moore, and then that will be followed by uh, the Town Council Oaths of Office for Frank Uvenali and Caitlin Jordan. So if the school board members elect would join me, please. Thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of the council, I'd like to uh, congratulate and welcome the new members, uh, newly elected members and re-elected members of the school board and the town council. So moving on, it is time for the roll call. Councilor Guvenali. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor swift Kayata. Here. And Councilor Walsh. Here. Here. Got ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Please join me. I believe in the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we move on to town council reports and correspondence, I have the pleasure of making a presentation. So could outgoing councillor Penny Jordan please join me over there? Penny, I want to thank you for your two years of service on the town council. You've been a great asset. You have worked hard for front the farm community, but also for everyone in the community. And uh, we have definitely appreciated all your hard work, especially as chair of appointments committee. So please accept this clock so you can remember your time on the council. <laughs> and uh, we know we'll be hearing from you on many issues because you're very active with the Cape Farm Alliance. Yeah. So thank you again. We appreciate thank you. it. Actually, I could say it. 
I'm leaving it in another Jordan's hands, so I have all the confidence in the world. And you look great in that seat. So thank you. The Jordan seat. <laughs> okay, moving on. Town Council reports and correspondence. Any councillors? Yes, Councillor Sullivan. Uh, I have two. On uh, November 12th, I attended the public safety appreciation day that was in the town um, fire uh, fire station, the town center fire station. This was a, an outreach program uh, by, uh, set up by HOPE, Healthy Outreach for Prevention and Education. It was very well attended by many students. All our public safety staff were there. Um, and I, I think that uh, it was a terrific event and many thanks to Kim Gillies and Julie Ewall for putting this together. That was delightful. And on um, uh, November 29th, I attended the Scarborough Town Hall public hearing on smart meters. And I did ask um, that uh, when we would be receiving a response to the resolution that we voted upon on November 8th. So. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay, hearing none. Moving on to the town manager's report. Would the rest of the items I will pass this month. Okay. Moving on, we need to review the minutes of the November 8, 2010 meeting. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any changes, discussion, corrections? Yes. Yes, on page 7. Uh, Paragraph, uh, Manager, Mike, Manager McGovern updated the Town Council on the $40,000 credit with PACS. The word loan, I'm sure, was intended to be spelled L-O-N-E and not L-O-A-N. I think that's right. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yep. And um, I also have a couple of changes that I'd like to make. That whole paragraph, I believe, took place, uh, that paragraph on page 7 that you just referred to where Manager McGovern updated us, I believe that took place under the citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. So I think that text should be moved down. And I had two other things. On page 3, item 123, uh, there was a draft resolution regarding smart meters. Under that, there was a motion by myself, seconded by Frank Governale, to approve the request of uh, Councillor Swift Kayata to recuse herself from discussion and voting on this item due to a possible conflict of interest as Mr. Kayata, meaning my husband, it's Mr. Kayata's law firm. That's why I recused myself. Represents Central Maine Power Company. And then lastly, on page five, under item 128, which had to do with MORC, the Municipal Operations Review Committee, under the motion, it said, uh, and I wanted to check with Dave on this one, it was the uh, ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council acknowledge receipt of the final report, and it's capitalized, of the Municipal Operations Review Committee. It was my understanding that this was just their final draft. They never actually delivered a final report. But I may be confused, and Dave, I wanted to ask you about that. No, that's correct. We had presented a memorandum uh, explaining why Mork had completed its work uh, unfinished, if you will, and that it was a draft report that was attached to the memorandum. Okay, so if, if we could change that to receipt of the it would be memorandum and draft report. Memorandum and draft report. <coughs> I will assume that the town clerk has captured all those. And I can't remember who made the motion to approve uh, the minutes, but would I you? I did, and I would accept those amendments. And the, the seconder? Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, then the motion is to approve those minutes as amended by uh, Councillor Sullivan and myself. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. So we come to item number one. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes. Do we have an opportunity for citizen discussion for items not on the I'm agenda? sorry. I 
skipped right over it. I'm so eager to get to the installation of the new chair. <laughs> Like, I just want to take your seat over. I, I just, I'm just trying to move that way. I'm All sorry. Right. Citizen, I do apologize. I think that's the first time I've ever forgotten that one. I've forgotten plenty of other things. But <clears throat> citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. This is an opportunity for uh, members of the public who may want to speak on any item that is not on the agenda. If it is on the agenda, they will have opportunities to speak during that item. So if there's anybody who would like to speak, please come forward. And no one's coming forward. So we can proceed, but thanks for reminding me. This is why it's good you're going to be moving to this chair. You're very alert. OK, now we can move on to item number one, which has to do with the election of a new town council chairman for the council year 2011. Do I hear a motion? Sarah? I have the pleasure of uh, set forth a motion to nominate David Sherman as the town council chair in the coming year for council year 2011. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous, and we'll pause for a moment so David and I can switch seats. Thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, the nameplate says Ansef Kayata. Those are big shoes to fill, and I will do my best in the coming year, uh, uh, as I have certainly good examples in the past to uh, look to. Uh, and I'm uh, gratified by everyone's uh, vote in my favor tonight. Uh, moving right along, uh, we do item number 2-2011, annual adoption of town council rules. Uh, we actually uh, adopt town council rules in the entirety. Uh, so at this point, I'd look for a motion. Ann. Move to accept. Second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Now we turn to uh, filling the rest of the leadership positions on the town council as well as the committee uh, assignments. Uh, do I have a motion? Ann. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I would move that we um, address or uh, deal with items number three through number 13 uh, in a block. Is that approach acceptable to the council? I think it, it I, I think my motion needs a second. So. Okay. I'll second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Okay, the motion carries. And then, Mr. Chairman, if I, Ye if yes. I might. Um, I would move that we uh, appoint the following people to the following committees and chairmanships. I will read them all, but these are the items 3 through 13. As finance chair, Sarah Lennon, and the council as a whole to serve as the finance committee. Jim Walsh as chairman of the ordinance committee and Frank Governale and Ann Swift Kayata as members. The appointments committee chair would be Jessica Sullivan with Caitlin Jordan and Sarah Lennon as members. Uh, the Caitlin Jordan and Mike McGovern uh, for terms to expire on December 31st, 2013 uh, to be appointed as representatives to the EcoMaine Board of Directors. Jim Walsh appointed as representative to the Greater Portland Council of Governments Executive Committee. Sarah Lennon to be appointed to be representative to the Greater Portland Council of Governments General Assembly with Caitlin Jordan to be her alternate. Mike McGovern to be appointed as representative to the PACS Policy Committee. Anne Swift Kayata to be appointed as representative to the Maine Municipal Association Legislative Policy Committee and the MMA Convention Delegate. Jessica Sullivan to be appointed as our representative to the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation. Sarah Lennon to be appointed as our representative to the Alternative Energy Committee and Jim Walsh to be appointed as representative to the Greater Portland Economic Development Corporation. 
we have a motion? Is there a second? A second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Item number 14 2011. Uh, this relates to appointment of citizens to fill vacant positions on boards and commissions. And I would turn to uh, Jessica Sullivan uh, for a report. Yes, thank you, Chair Sherman. <laughs> Um, we have a slate of citizens that the Appointments Committee is recommending for the, these, the positions on boards and commissions. We are very pleased to present this slate of citizens. We'd like to thank all the applicants for their time and their willingness to serve the community. We, had, we were really overwhelmed with outstanding citizens and there were choices that were most difficult. But again, we thank everyone for applying and, and we'd like, I would like to uh, make a motion, I guess, that we accept the uh, citizens as put forth by the Appointments Committee to serve on boards and commissions. Second. second that. Second. Motion has been made and seconded by several. Uh, any further uh, discussion? All those in favor? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, did you have discussion? Or? I was just going to second her thanks of everybody who applied and all the people that we chose. It was really a lot of fun because every single person who walked through the door was very um, highly qualified and incredibly enthusiastic about it. So. Right. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? <coughs> Thank you. Okay, the, we have a public hearing scheduled tonight on the proposed uh, PACE ordinance. Uh, as the outgoing chair of the ordinance committee, I will uh, briefly introduce this. Uh, we've recommended a proposed ordinance to enable citizens to participate in a federal and state program administered by the Efficiency Maine Trust that would assist residents with receiving loans for energy efficiency improvements. And we have tonight here Dana Fisher from the Efficiency Maine Trust who will be available to answer any questions that we may have and, or, and perhaps give a, a brief explanation of the program. Uh, what is the council's pleasure? We have a public hearing set. Do we want to have Mr. Fisher speak first and then open it up for public hearing or? or okay. Dana, would you? And thank you for coming tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, address the council. I'm Dana Fisher. I'm a residential program specialist with Efficiency Maine Trust. Um, I, I really have only been with Efficiency Maine for uh, coming on eight, nine months now. I was brought on uh, in part because of my um, uh, training as an energy auditor, but also because of uh, my background in, in uh, municipal government. And I, I you know, worked at three different municipalities in Cumberland County uh, in a couple of different uh, positions, mostly in finance and uh, tax collection. So I'm keenly familiar with the issues that face municipalities, and it's that expertise that I kind of brought to the table in the uh, uh, implementation of PACE uh, legislation here in the state. PACE uh, legislation stands for uh, Property Assessed Clean Energy. It's a form of legislation that passed in uh, nearly two dozen states around the country in the course of the last year, um, most of them following a model that was uh, piloted in California where municipalities would provide funds for residents to uh, uh, install uh, weatherization techniques or, or uh, solar uh, panels on their rooftops and pay for them through their tax assessments. Um, Maine's PACE law that passed this past April was slightly different in that it, it uh, instead of being through taxes, it is treated as a secondary mortgage or similar to a home equity loan. Um, and while it does allow for municipalities to administer the program um, on their own behalf, it also provides uh, a mechanism by which municipalities would be able to uh, allow efficiency main trust to administer that program on their behalf, uh, conduct all of the billing uh, and all of the management of all aspects of the program and generally create a more centralized, uh, more efficient uh, program for um, a relatively uniform loan program across the state. This uh, was uh, envisioned to dovetail with a $30 million grant that Efficiency Maine applied for with uh, the Department of Energy 
to uh, set up a revolving loan program. Uh, so the two work together, and we have been working steadily over the summer and this fall, uh, going through the statutory rulemaking process, uh, which has just recently been finalized and completed, um, and spreading the word to municipalities all across the state uh, for their requirements in allowing their citizens to participate. One of the uh, key aspects of that uh, participation is the passage of an ordinance. Um, now, while uh, Efficiency Maine has essentially established the program in such a manner that the towns have no cost, liability, or obligation for anything outside of, of uh, providing uh, educational materials to their citizenry, um, we, are, uh, we are required to uh, have municipalities that wish to participate pass a model ordinance and establish a contract regarding the administration with Efficiency Maine. Um, and so that is the purpose for the visit tonight. Um, for all intents and purposes, uh, PACE and any other, other financing uh, programs that Efficiency Maine would set up would be for uh, providing funds for residents to uh, engage in weatherization and save uh, both oil and money. Uh, on an annualized basis. Uh, to date, we have over, uh, in, in, in the course of the last seven months, the Home Energy Savings Program has operated um, without that aid of financing through PACE, but we've had more than 700 homes completed in the course of the last seven or eight months um, with an average completion uh, expected savings of 38% uh, in their energy costs. Uh, the average project cost is also around $10,000. So all of the participants have been able to afford um, these kind of improvements, but it's broadly recognized that by creating a lending mechanism that is both long-term and at relatively low interest, uh, that we would be able to uh, leverage those resources into a great number more houses um, in a number of communities uh, to participate. And, and we know to date that there are several in, in uh, Cape Elizabeth that have already un undergone this process. So if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And I, I again, thank you for the opportunity to address the council. Well, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, I, why don't I open it up for a public hearing now? And then if, we, if the council has questions for you, uh, we could then revisit that after the public hearing concludes. Thank you. Um, so I will now open the uh, public hearing on the proposed PACE ordinance. Anybody wishing to speak on the proposed PACE ordinance, please come up to the lectern, introduce yourself. Seeing no one coming to the lectern, I will now close the public hearing uh, and would ask at this point if the council has any questions uh, regarding the proposed ordinance. Jessica. I, I do. <clears throat> would you repeat your name again? Uh, Fisher. Fisher. Fisher, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have a several questions. The first one is on Article 4, con concerning Article 4, conformity with the requirements of the trust. Uh, this is Section 23-4-1, standards adopted, rules promulgate, prom promulgated, model documents. It says, if the trust adopts standards, promulgates rules, or establishes model documents subsequent to the municipality's adoption of this ordinance. Uh, it says the, the, the municipality shall take necessary steps to conform to it. My concern is uh, if we adopt this ordinance, the trust can change the rules later at some point. That's how I read this section. And we would then have to conform to those rules and standards. And one of my concerns is that the, the trust could later decide to, that the municipality is its agent, which would, in my view, you know, be a significant burden, administrative burden, et cetera. So I wondered if, if what your thoughts were, if there are any examples of this that you're aware of. And also, is this a federal or a state standard? Excuse me, uh, Mr. Yes, could you go back to the lectern? That way we will pick up your statements. I'm sorry, that, that last piece, the federal issue. Well, I wondered if, yeah, if this is a standard that is a federal standard or a state standard. In other words, 
I mean, if it's a, this is because there are federal monies that are involved with this program, is this a federal standard? Or if it's at a state level, perhaps it's tweakable. Yeah. Well, in, in, of course, efficiency means, you know, when, we're, when we have grants, we're, uh, you know, we have to answer for the, for the grants from where they come from. So, you know, if DOE says well, there are different requirements uh, in terms of data reporting, we're going to have to fulfill those requirements. In, the, in that particular section, what's being addressed there, it's really, um, it's more of an advisement that if there, if, as we don't have control of the state law, if the state legislature opened up the bill and decided to change parts of the law, um, and in some way they were regarded as um, incongruent with the ordinance, then it's more of an advisement that the council would be asked to modify the ordinance in order to be in compliance with state law. Honestly, I don't really think that there is a significant amount of opportunity for, for that kind of drastic change. We're certainly not anticipating that. We currently have 39 municipalities that have passed the ordinances. We're hoping that uh, we'll have uh, very close to 100% participation by, uh, by this time next June. Um, but um, so there are some municipalities that have raised issue with that particular phrase and have actually struck it from the model ordinance. We don't really have any qualm with that. And of course, if there were some changes to the state law or even to the rules that were set forth by efficiency mean in the course of administering the program, there are clauses in both the, in, in the contract regarding uh, withdrawal from the program, which would have no adverse effect upon the uh, prior participants from your municipality. Um, my next question is uh, concerns interest rate. I just wondered at the, the last um, document, documentation that we had, the interest rates had not been determined. Have they been determined since then? And, and, and if so, and if not, how, how will you be doing that? Yeah, we're, we're, we're very close to that, in fact. Um, we're in final uh, discussion and establishment of a contract with a, um, a a financial provider that will be able to administer the program as, as, our, as our master provider and agent. Um, it'll be very seamless when people call Efficiency Maine. It'll be Efficiency Maine calling, answering the phone, but we certainly don't profess to have a whole lot of banking expertise within, within our, uh, our, our group. So as we uh, contract out different services, that is among the services that we would contract out. Um, the, uh, the interest rate that we're establishing, we're anticipating that to be um, at or below 5%, at least initially. Um, and that will be set once we have all the terms and conditions of the contract worked out with the master provider. The intention of setting an interest rate is really to um, provide for the long-term stability of the loan fund, but also to provide an interest rate that is attractive to the marketplace so that people will be able to participate and, and, uh, and receive savings, you know, uh, be, be as close to cash positive as possible uh, from, the, from the outset. Um, so we, it really very much depends on the cost, but our intention is to have it be low enough so that it so that it's viable, but also high enough so that we're receiving funds sufficient to extend the revolving loan program over time and expand it to the point where it can provide enough financing for, for whatever weatherization is needed across the state. Is there any provision for um, failure? Of the... Uh, the failure of the, of the loan uh, terms. Mm. And then future funding for the program. So therefore, if, if people default on these loans, if that occurs, how, how will you then fund the program? Well, if there are defaults, of course, there's no obligation or cost to the town. So in no, in no way, under no conditions, would the, the uh, trust be uh, looking to the town to be liable for those, for those funds. Um, what we've seen in experience with uh, this type of a loan program where it is tied to uh, the mortgage, albeit in a secondary uh, fashion, um, is that the, uh, the delinquency rate is relatively low, just a couple of percentage points. And so the intent would be to have that uh, difference in the delinquency made up in the course of that 5% interest rate uh, that's, that's accrued across all of it. Um, so, and of course, once the $20 million from the loan pool is out, 
uh, the funds coming back in, the revenue on a monthly basis, someplace in the ballpark of $150,000 would then in turn be utilized as uh, revenue to, to float the bonds for expanding the program size. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim. Uh, Dana, thank you for coming this evening. Um, you spent some uh, time with us in the Ordinance Committee and uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the education and outreach programs that are required as a result of this. Could you give us an overview of that and have there been anything added to this plan since we last spoke, now that you have 39 communities on board? Yes, we, well, the, the, uh, and I, I have, I've been to communities all across the state and of course, um, as many communities as there are across the state, nearly 500, there's nearly 500 forms of local government as well. And there are also 500 different levels of, of uh, capability at the different towns in terms of what they're able to uh, commit uh, in terms of resources for education and, and outreach. So there's no hard and fast rule as to what any one community must do for uh, their outreach. There are communities where, let's say, Rousick, for example, Town of 500, they have a one-room schoolhouse that is uh, utilized as their town hall and meeting area. They will have uh, notices go out in the newsletter. They'll have brochures that are available, but they don't even have, uh, you know, a general cable TV, cable TV channel, so they wouldn't be able to uh, transmit along those lines. But what we're going to do for every community is provide... Uh, Brochures on HASP, we will provide, uh, which is the Home Energy Savings Program, we'll provide um, guideline books for uh, the use by energy committees to uh, read about the different resources that are available at both the state and federal level. Um, and we plan to also provide uh, DVD uh, TV media uh, for the use uh, through the cable TV at different municipalities at their discretion and hope to update those materials and send them out. Our intention is to have a, a packet arrive at all the municipalities prior to launch next month um, so that they would have those materials ready as soon as, as soon as the program's ready to go. Thank you. Any other questions? Just in case people are wondering why we're considering an ordinance for a program that's not going to be administered by the town of Cape Elizabeth, that does not have any sort of financial impact on the town of Cape Elizabeth, in order for our citizens to be eligible for this loan program, the town has, the municipality has to, to pass an ordinance. That's correct. Thank okay. you. So that's why we're here. Um, any, any further discussion? Uh, do I hear a motion then? I move uh, that, we, uh, that we accept the uh, proposed uh, Chapter 23 um, ordinance uh, entitled Property Assessed Clean Energy or PACE Ordinance as uh, fully described in your packets this evening. Second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Item number 16-2011 are the Planning Board revised rules. Um, I see we have the Chair yes. of the Planning Board, <coughs> still, <laughs> here with us, Peter Hadem. Could you uh, give us a summary of sure. where we are and what? Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Peter Hadem, and I'm currently the Chair of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Councillor Sherman on his ascension to the Chair. I had the privilege of serving <laughs> with him on the Planning Board and, and as a Chair, and uh, I can tell you're in very capable hands. Uh, what you have in front of you tonight is a proposal to increase public participation uh, in the planning board process. Uh, we've expanded uh, in the proposed changes to the rules and regulations uh, the ability and the opportunity for the public to comment at, at uh, portions of the public um, uh, hearings that we have, the public meetings that we have um, when considering an application. And um, there's a lengthy memo that I uh, submitted to the council uh, in support of the proposed changes and rather than rehash that I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple portions uh, one in the positive which is we are increasing the public uh, uh, the public's opportunity to comment at, at all public meetings of the planning board which was not particularly there in the regulations before 
Um, the one thing that we are, are, are leaving as it is right now with the possibility some, for some future consideration, but uh, is that the uh, public, the workshop sessions that we do have with applicants, uh, we will still invite and encourage explicitly in the new regulations, encourage written comments, uh, but due to a uh, memorandum that we solicited and obtained from the Maine Municipal Association, uh, we're leaving the opportunity for, for public participation in the workshop sessions just the way they are right now. Uh, we would ask that the board consider the rules and regulations uh, as we propose them and pass them so we can start implementing them in our work um, as soon as possible. I'm here to answer any questions and, um, and we would hope you could favorably consider the rules. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Peter Hayden? Peter, it seemed like the sort of the one issue or the main issue was whether to allow public comment during the workshops. Could you just, I mean, I, I've seen the memo and I've seen sure. the opinion, but could sure. you just explain what the concern is about that? Certainly. The, um, the, in the role that the planning board has in its um, capacity to approve projects, uh, we're acting almost like a, in, in, in a judicial capacity. We're making a decision that binds applicants and the town on certain parts of its ordinance. Um, in order to have a fair process for public participation, uh, there are rules that the board has to follow state statutes that once substantive, substantive review of a project has started, the applicant has certain rights to have their, their project considered in a timely way. And in order to keep those triggers, the start of that substantive review process, from being started too early, um, we are deferring that until there's been a finding of completeness. At the completeness stage, the public is going to be allowed and has always been allowed to participate in that process. But at the workshop shop stage, we do not want to trigger the substantive review of a project too early, which would, of course, uh, start the, the clock ticking on some of the deadlines. Um, uh, frankly, the uh, Maine Municipal Association Attorney's opinion, which you have, uh, was pretty strong in this respect, frankly, stronger than I anticipated. But under that uh, suggestion, we're going to keep, we're recommending to the council that we keep that portion of the uh, rules and regulations the same. Uh, Frank? Yeah, sorry. So, um, you speak, Chair. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, just speaking, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, in other words, uh, while there can't be a give and take in the workshop session, <clears throat> public hearing, su hearing subsequent to that, the kind of give and take that people expect, would otherwise might expect in a workshop could occur. At every meeting. Correct. And in fact, we have always done this in the meetings, but we're now explicitly stating in the rules. Even at the workshop sessions, we're encouraging public written comments back to the board based on what the public may see, because of course they are open to the public, even though they're not televised, what they see and hear from the applicants from the, from the process. So people should, should understand, it is not no public participation in the workshop session, it's just the method of communicating is slightly different depend because of that uh, statutory restriction. Uh, Ann. I'm not sure this is so much a question, but I, I have some concerns. And I want to preface this by saying I have the highest regard for the planning board and for their chair. Um, and I have not served on the planning board, so I'm certainly no expert on this. But it seems to me there's some inconsistencies in, in these rules, and, and maybe I wasn't reading some of the things, including that legal opinion from the MMA lawyer the same way, but um, it, it, it seems in, in, the, in the cover memo, the October 29th memo, it says the board strongly encourages written comments and that um, planning board members are trained to ask questions and that often comments made by the planning board members originate from written comments sent by the public. It, this is at workshops or before workshops. Correct. And it's not clear to me how a, a public comment at the beginning of a meeting, the beginning of a workshop, is really any different from a citizen email that got sent 15 or 20 minutes before the meeting. And um, I understand you don't want to trigger the, the to and fro kind of thing because that will trigger some of your, you know, your deadlines, the clock starts ticking and everything. But it, it seems to me that it, it might be a good idea, and I, I want to hear back from you more on this, it might be a good idea 
to allow the public to comment at workshops. I do understand that you don't want to get sucked into a two-way conversation, but if the planning board members are, are getting emails that same day and then in, in effect sort of commenting on things that are raised in those emails, that just doesn't seem any different to me than if you heard them, you know, two minutes into a meeting when, when, when a member of the public just sort of stood up and said them. Um, so it, it seems to me the benefit of increased public communication, which is what I think we're trying to strive for with all the boards and commissions, including the council, um, having rules like this about um, public input. It seems to me those benefits vastly outweigh the cost of the small chance that a change of date of substantive review would have a negative impact on the town. So that's one argument. And, and then I don't understand why the discussion of an app, my second question is why is the discussion of an applicant's points not substantive review and why is the board's discussion of points raised in previous emails not substantive review, but planning board discussion of a point raised in a workshop by a citizen would trigger substantive review? Why are those things different? So please help me understand, because I'm sure there's a great point to be made here, but the, I'm just the, not the getting The emails it. that we tend to get af are after a workshop session. Um, and, and the, prior to the... Uh, the first formal submission of the plan. What okay. the workshop session is designed to do is to give the applicant an informal opportunity to run the general idea by the board, and that's frequently the, the first time the public has some opportunity to sort of see what the general plan is. There is no detailed submission requirements. There are often, often sketch plans, concept ideas. Um, and I would suggest that, you know, given that the, uh, the odds, the, the chance of a, uh, of a give and take turning into substantive review versus the equivalent email response um, is the same information that the planning board is getting, you, you have almost no risk with the written comments. And frankly, from a planning board member's perspective, mm -hmm. I find those much more valuable, sort of, at, you know, in, set in a little more, with a little more articulation what the concerns of a particular uh, um, neighbor or whatever is uh, as far as the workshop shop session goes as to what they're hearing at it. Um, we wrestled with this quite a bit. We originally put that out there. We originally considered having um, the public comment in a very, very limited way. Uh, some of the concerns were um, where exactly do you stop the process at the workshop to not trigger the substantive review uh, of a particular project. We actually had tried to draft something that sort of bridged both, uh, tried to achieve both goals. And, and anyway, we drafted it. We started to run into concerns that we had uh, that we were, we were walking over that line. And that's one of the reasons we solicited the opinion of the Maine Municipal Association. And then we, then we decided it was probably better in terms of discretion to pull back, work with the change that we do have, which increases public comment period at the public meeting stage. Mm -hmm. And then if there is a way to, I mean, these can be revised now and then an additional language could be put in or, or considered for the workshop session. I, you know, I, I would resist that. I'm not sure I remember. What was your second point? Well, is there back and forth? I've never gone before the planning board as an applicant. So mm -hmm. is there back and forth in a workshop between an applicant and the board? I mean, is there sort of... You know, tell me about this, what about that, well, giving suggestions? Well, it's, is it's, there back and forth? It's frequently a one-way presentation in that what they are proposing is just something that we believe would be favorably, favorably considered, whether it matches up with the, the standards that we're you know, duty-bound to apply under, under the zoning ordinance. And um, particularly, we have some authority to waive submission requirements, mm -hmm. uh, and that's frequently one of the issues that comes up at the workshop sessions is, depending on the scale of the project, we may cut down or expand mm -hmm. um, the, the uh, again, subject to a formal meeting and a full hearing, uh, what submission requirements that they may be looking to waive or not. So I, that, guess, I guess the point is that, and I'll finish up, I sure. won't rant on about this, but I guess the point is that um, some citizens, mm -hmm. rightfully or wrongfully, feel that applicants who are citizens are getting the benefit of putting their input in at an earlier stage than the citizens who aren't the applicant 
get to comment on it. Um, so I have some concerns. I, I don't want to belabor the point, but um, I, I also, again, want to say that you know I'm, I'm certainly no expert on planning board matters, and I'm not an attorney myself, and so I'm not trying to tread on the planning board's uh, toes in terms of forming their own <coughs> rules, but I just have some concerns about this as they are drafted just for the workshop session. This section. The only the other sections is fine. And I would just very briefly respond to your very first point that you just made, which is if that give and take that input that the applicant is getting from the board, the public is there. The public has an opportunity to, to give similar feedback to the board almost almost as soon as the applicant is hearing it without the danger of triggering the substantive review. And that is the balance that we're trying to strike here. Okay. Uh. Thank thank you. Uh, and, and, yes, Jessica. I have a question. I've never attended one of these, but is the predominant uh, <coughs> issue at a workshop application completeness? No, 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 not, not at all. Completeness is a formal process that CAPE has. Um, frankly, I, I, in my private practice, I do work in many other towns and in some other states, and it is, not, it is not a requirement that all of the municipalities have, but it is an excellent one. Because frankly, in other towns, you tend to see what I would call garbage plans come forward uh, without that check. You don't tend to see those in Cape Elizabeth because there has been a vetting process that the public and the applicant participates in right up to the com completeness issue. The stages are workshop, which is very limited feedback, and then the public has an opportunity to give written comments to the board. The formal application, which triggers the, the substantive review, the, f the completeness hearing, and that's where we're adding the opportunity for more public input. And then once the project is deemed complete, the, the, the uh, ordinance deadlines trigger, start to trigger. And then you have a full hearing on the merits of the project. Again, we're, we're moving the depth and breadth of public participation up that process. And we're stopping at the workshop session because of the concern we have that that trigger could start earlier than the, then it is really in the town's interest to have it start. Jim. And again, the, the spirit of the communications um, strategy was to, to, to do just what he's talking about, mm -hmm. is move that public input earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. And what I like about it is that if we get this started and you're willing to go back and look at the workshop component, and if there's a way to do something with that to allow for input that doesn't trigger the sort of Time, time clock that goes sure. off. But I, I really, I, I thought that Anne's comments about the conflict she has between email and actual physical presence in the room, because we've been discussing chat. How does chat play in the process of public input? Meaning I am. Yeah, and, and yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a, because we're, I, again, as a communication strategy, we're trying to wrestle with all of these forms of communication so that we are responding correctly and allowing for citizen input. So, and if we, if we didn't, if the planning board didn't have the slightly different role, I mean, you're, you're a legislative body, and I don't want to get too hyper legal technical here, but the point is we're making legally binding decisions that people have vested property rights in, and I think that's one of the reasons yeah. there has to be at some point a, a check here in terms of yeah. where, it, where it stops and where it starts. And there are other ways to do it, but I don't want to get too expansive here. We have a proposal in front of you. We're willing to consider moving it up. There are also other ways to handle it. Maybe that's a discussion, an informal discussion we can have a different time. Uh, Frank. <coughs> Senator Curiosity, Peter, have uh, any other towns in the state challenged the MMA position and allow public input at the workshop stage? Uh, actually, they tend not to have the same depth of a workshop of process that we have. It's much more formal. So what tends to happen is the plans come in, I won't say half-baked, but not nearly as, <laughs> as cooked as when they get filed here. And then, and then well, then, <laughs> I'll beat the metaphor to death here, but the, the point is you tend to waste more public resources um, sort of vetting out and cleaning up the plans uh, than, than we do here at Cape. It's a much more efficient process, and I think it truly benefits uh, the town uh, way more than some other town processes do. Maybe Tom can. <laughs> All right. uh, before we get to a motion, um, our town council rules do allow members of the public who would like to comment on an issue that's on the agenda to come forward and speak. Uh, the limit would be three minutes. 
Uh, we don't have a formal public hearing notice for tonight, but the rules do allow public comment at this stage if anybody would like to comment. Yes, Mr. Plimpton. <coughs> I've already commented at length in a letter to the council, and uh, my first point is, you know, I, I was at some of the workshops and discussions about um, responding to public comments and with something substantive instead of I consider. I've gotten no response whatsoever to my letter. No response from Mr. Hatem or from the council about the questions I raised about what are these deadlines that are going to be triggered by this uh, so-called substantive review. What, how, how long does it take to get approval? Why isn't the workshop just the fact that there's a workshop and there's an exchange between the applicant and the board not a substantive review? You know, I, I don't have an answer to any of those questions. I tried to come up with some of the deadlines and there's no response, there's no discussion. You know, if, if there's a substantive review, um, that's going to be because there was a workshop. Because it's not because the public spoke. I've been to workshops. There's give and take. What happens is it's not a level playing field because they all become buddies. Oh, a nice project. This, make this change, do that. And the public can't speak. Yeah, they can come afterwards, or they can come before, but they don't have much to talk about before. And the other thing is, as a judicial body, th this, is a, this is a judicial body holding a hearing. You know, you don't have a hearing before a judge in which the judge has people come into the chamber and talk, and then, oh, the public or the opponent can come afterwards. This, this is a travesty. And, you know, I think it's great to have, I think it's an efficient thing to have the workshop, but I think the risk is almost minimal. If you're going to have the workshop, then you're going to have a risk of a substantive review, and you've got to move the thing forward. If you don't want to have that risk, don't have the workshop. Now, maybe no one will challenge it, but I guess I'm just kind of disturbed that you know I raised some good points, and there's no response. There's no attempt to deal with it. And this has happened before the planning board, too, on Eastman Meadows. I raised a lot of good questions, never a response, no uh, give and take, and I sat at workshops with Eastman Meadows and couldn't say anything, and the applicant got an advantage. So I just would like you to consider that, and I think, I think this is a travesty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak on this topic? Okay, are there any... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you getting up, Mary. Um, I'm Mary Esposito, 1000 Sawyer Road. Um, I have the same concerns as my husband, David Plimpton. Um, one of the concerns I have um, that he didn't really go into is we have a lawyer, chair of the... Uh, planning board, we have a ostensibly legal opinion from a lawyer from the Maine Municipal Association, we still do not understand what makes substantive review. I don't understand it. I'm a lawyer. I do not understand the planning boards or the Maine Municipal Association lawyers' point about substantive review. I understand the concept. But ne neither of them has gone into exactly, uh, Councillor uh, Swift Pay at his question, why is going back and forth with the applicant not substantive review, and that's fine, but going back and forth or allowing citizen comments, substantive review, that's bad. I don't understand it, and I think if before you approve this, <clears throat> you should understand it. And if any of you do understand it, please explain to me the difference between the board talking to the applicant and the board listening to citizens. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak on this topic? 
Okay. Are there any further questions or comments from the council at this point? And we also have the town planner here as well, as well as the chair of the planning board. Uh, Sarah? Do you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> well, I was just going to make a suggestion of how we might move forward. But sure. that might be preempting a question or point. I, I guess I would, I would like to, if, was, if we can get a response to Mary's question, because I certainly don't know the answer to it. And that's fine with me. I think we could possibly in a, be in a position to move forward with a motion to approve or not these rules, uh, but it sounds like there would be enough sentiment on the council to ask the planning board to revisit the issue in the coming year about public comment in, a, in the workshop setting. Um, but Frank, you had a question, so Peter? I, I, meaning that you would cons consider the, the pending proposal with some, with some request to see if we can expand on that into the workshop sessions, but not hold up what we've proposed so far. Is that what, what the chair and the reason I, I just want to understand what you're yeah, the reason, and that's correct. The reason I make that suggestion is at least when I was on the planning board, we had, sort of, we had one public hearing on the application. That was it. Yeah, and right. then yet we had two or three public meetings where there'd be amendments to the plan, the right. public would show up, they'd want to comment on the amended plan, and because we hadn't advertised the hearing, they couldn't. And that was incredibly frustrating for Citizen. Public, citizens, the abutters. And so I, I see this as a, a, a real big move in the right direction. Agreed. Uh, but since the planning board had some heartburn about the substantive review issue being triggered at a workshop, I would be willing to move forward with the proposed amendments and then ask the board to reconsider that issue in the coming year. But that's just me speaking. Uh, no, I, think that, I think that's a good suggestion for the very specific reason you just said, which is, you know, we have a, a bigger hole to fill, and I'm, I would like to see that process continue to move forward, e even as we wrestle with the, the, the issues that have been raised tonight. So can you get, can so, you get an answer to the question of substance? Yeah, what is you? it? I mean, well, uh, I think... <laughs> It's one of these, I, 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 I can't define it, but I can tell you when I've seen it. And, and I think the difference is when the application, applicant, it's not even an applicant, it's a proposed, it's a, someone who's considering filing an application. There is nothing filed with the town clerk, there's nothing filed with the planning office when anyone off the, you know, with a, with a written request comes in for the, to, the, uh, to the planning board saying, this is what I'm thinking of submitting. And we have a very specific set of guidelines called the zoning ordinance the guidelines requirements that we have in order to uh, that, the, that the applicant has to f uh, fulfill in order to have us favorably favorably consider approval. I mean, it's it's what they look at when they the engineers and their attorneys when they decide to uh, to uh, uh, submit that. And the and the the request for a workshop session is to is to vet out some of the um, the items in there that they may either put in or not put in as part of the submission requirement. It's a very very big project. We want lots of information. If it's a very, very small project, we may, you know, we, they may ask us to waive or consider something else. But the, the, the sharp distinction that, that I, as best I can come up with right now is, in fact, there's nothing submitted for, formally to be considered by the planning board Yes, yet. The difficulty is, you know, de facto, in fact, if you consider too much at the workshop session with public comment and applicant requests back and forth, in fact, that may trigger the review. And that's what the applicant's going to do. And in one way, there's only one way to test that. And, you know, it's to do it and see if we get sued. I mean, I'm, I'm much more into prevention. And I'd rather, you know, especially with the opportunities we now have for much expanded public input rather than the single hearing that we've been working with in the past. Um, I think, I'm hoping that over the next year or two, as the public sees that more and more, um, maybe there'll be less, less of a need, so it's, uh, that we, we may need more public input at the, planning, at the workshop session. It is a valuable tool that I would hate to see sort of evaporate because we've expanded the formal submission requirements. And the MMA attorney had actually made a suggestion, which was to, if you were going to allow public comment at a workshop, to do it at the very end to Keep minimize. Keep it very, very limited, essentially. But in any event, uh, does any, before we get to a motion, does anybody, Sarah, do you have? I was going to give you a motion. Okay. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> okay, Sarah? In the spirit of moving this forward, because it feels like it's great progress, and thank you, Peter. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to propose that we adopt this with the request that you continue to examine it and feel out what might work for increasing 
participation in a workshop. Therefore, I move we adopt the Planning Board revised rules of procedure for the conduct of their, at their meetings set forth in our packets tonight. Okay. Is there a second? second? Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Six to one. Six to one, yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> the item number 17-2011, uh, the council will now hear the appeal of Robert Steer, Jr., uh, though before you, Mr. Steer, before you get up to the lectern, it's going to be, set up oh, you're going to set it up, okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yeah, can I just introduce it? And then, Certainly. Uh, we're going to hear the appeal of Robert Steer, Jr. of 9 Rockcrest Drive regarding driveway permit number 2010-12. Issued by Public Works Director Robert C. Mallon, 6 Stonegate Road, tax map U31, lot 9D. The owner of this property is Early Bird Group LLC, represented by its authorized member, Graham Pillsbury. And before we actually get into the content of the appeal, uh, Anne, you got it. Yes, um, I uh, will be asking the council um, to permit to me to prove by recusing myself, my husband is a close personal friend and a partner in the litigation department at Mr. Steer's law firm, and therefore I feel I am not an unbiased party. Okay. And do we then need a formal motion? You might see if there's others recusing themselves too. So. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Are there any other members of the council? Okay. I'm chair for one night and everybody's just jumping up. Okay. Uh, Jim. Um, I, I will ask the uh, council to recuse me as well. Um, I am a homeowner in the Stonegate uh, development and I uh, also feel that um, I know all the parties involved here. Okay. Frank. I own property in Stonegate development and uh, a member of the association therefore I also request recusal. Okay. Jessica, Caitlin, and Sarah, are you still with me? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I think the, there are a lot of standards that we could look to, whether a recusal is appropriate, uh, a pecuniary interest in the particular application or the project, uh, but also if a member of the council feels in, uh, that he or she is not going to be able to render a fair and unbiased decision, to me, it's fairly obvious that we ought to... Uh, Moved that they be recused, and all three have identified issues that I think are pretty significant so in terms moved. of their ability. So we have a motion to recuse. I'll I'll make my motion to recuse all three of us. Okay. For so the reasons stated individually. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. All those in favor of the motion to recuse. Uh, is that is it proper yes. for the recusees to be? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they passed for it, so they had the position. Okay. Balance. Yeah. Because right. otherwise we couldn't have made the motion. All right. All those in favor of the motion? It carries <coughs> unanimously. So have a seat and have fun. Thank you. Can I ask a procedural question? Does yes. this continue with our roles of majority or well, can we still vote? Well, why don't I, I before we actually hear from Mr. Steer, I may just have a few preliminary questions for the town attorney, if you don't mind, Mr. Steer. Um, we are uh, acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. We are being asked to determine whether the, prop the permit was properly issued by Robert Malley, the Town Public Works Director. And uh, I had some questions myself as to what it was we were actually going to be reviewing. Were we going to look at whether uh, we thought the permit ought to have been issued, whether we think there was enough information before Bob Malley to support his decision. So with that in mind, I would ask Tom Leahy, the town's attorney, to give the council some guidance here because as far as I understand, we haven't typically uh, been put into the position of, uh, of a review or appeal board. Correct. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. I'm Tom Leahy, the town attorney, and uh, this is a, a matter of first impression for me, having a driveway in this appeal to the uh, town council. You are acting in a quasi-judicial manner, you are reviewing whether Mr. Malley 
properly issued a permit, specifically a ruling on an appeal um, of that permit. The motion ultimately be to grant the appeal or deny the appeal. The four members who are, who are qualified to act, um, I think it would take, um, if it's a 2-2 vote, then the uh, permit would stand, in my opinion. Um, the uh, submissions are, uh, there's a submission from this, from the uh, Stonegate uh, president. There's a, a PowerPoint submission from the appellant. Uh, there's also um, materials presented uh, through the uh, town manager and perhaps tonight uh, from Mr. Malley. Mr. Malley being um, the public works director, um, we thought appropriate to have his own counsel um, Pat Dunn of the Jensen Baird Law Firm is here tonight to represent Mr. Malley in regard to this appeal. Um, as to the standards for review, uh, there's nothing specified under either statute or the ordinance. Um, given that there has not been a hearing below, uh, like a trial to be reviewed on appeal, uh, we think it's uh, certainly appropriate and uh, allowable for the council to uh, not only receive Mr. Malley's submissions that are part of the application permit, but in regard to this appeal, whatever is appropriate and germane to the, uh, the appellant's position. Um, I don't want to prejudge, I don't want to get into what's germane quite yet, but it, it's, um, you have both Mr. Steer and Ms., um, the uh, president of the Stonegate Association making submissions. Um, as far as the program or the conduct, we thought it might be appropriate to have the appellant go first. That seems appropriate. To have Mr. Malley go second. Um, the chair can limit time as appropriate. Um, I'm available to answer questions as to uh, uh, any legal aspects of this. Um, I've suggested since any matter of this nature may go to court on an ADB appeal hereafter, that it be a appropriate for the council to, uh, who are participating uh, to uh, adopt findings of fact uh, and conclusions and then in, in regard to his decision. Um, I get some suggestions, not with yes or no, but just uh, thoughts, uh, items to be addressed uh, to uh, the chairs uh, before the meeting. Um, I, um, so that's how I think the meeting should go. I think we need I guess more specifically, I can address questions as they come up. I think that's the overview of how we address it. I do not have any submissions that I know of from the uh, owner, from Early Bird Group LLC. To my knowledge, hasn't made submissions, and I don't know if they're going to make the presentation tonight. Okay, well, I see that they're here, so uh, we can ask that question after we've heard from Mr. Steer and Mr. Malley. Uh, are there any other questions for uh, the town attorney? Um, before we actually get to Mr. Steer's presentation, the town manager just pointed out to me that uh, a vote on a motion to recuse actually needs to be uh, made by the remaining council members who aren't seeking recusal. So we would, if we could just re-vote it, have another motion and a second, and then since it was unanimous the last time, I wouldn't expect any change. But would somebody be willing to make a motion to recuse Frank Governelli, Jim Walsh, and Nancy Piata? Jessica? I so move. Okay, is there a second? Seconded by Sarah Lennon. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Okay. Uh, Mr. Steer, uh, you indicated in your submission that this would take about 10 minutes. That time frame is, is certainly fine, so. I'm hopeful, yes, thank you yeah. very much. Sure. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council. My name is Bob Steer, we live for a little over 15 years. I have lived at 9 Rockgrass Drive, which is in the Stonegate subdivision. I'm here tonight as an individual, but you should know that this is an issue that is of significant concern to my neighbors. Many of them are also here tonight, and I request that the members from Stonegate who are here stand up at this time just to be recognized. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, mindful of the time constraints uh, tonight and also mindful of the fact that 
this is a narrow issue that you are being asked to consider. The statement that was submitted by Rachel Stamyeshkin goes beyond the, the confines of the issue here, which is whether the Director of Public Works properly uh, granted a permit that provides for the entrance of a driveway onto Stonegate Road. And we are, I am asking you to reverse the grant of that permit. Um, and I'm going to make an abbreviated presentation to the one that I've submitted in light of the time constraints. Um, but I trust that you understand why I'm here tonight. Um, there is property now being marketed as new construction in Stonegate, which is just inside the entrance to the subdivision. And that property is on a lot that is smaller than lots in Stonegate. It is of a house size that is significantly smaller than other houses in Stonegate. And it is not subject to any of the covenants that apply to all of the other houses in Stonegate. And for that reason, uh, we are concerned that the decision to provide a Stonegate Road address for this property that is not part of the subdivision is fundamentally unfair. And this is the first opportunity that anyone from Stonegate has had to be heard on this issue. It has not been to the planning board. It has not, we have not had any chance before now to raise our concerns with this development that has a substantial impact on our subdivision. Dave, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, I was just going to ask you, because you uh, began saying that we were dealing with a limited issue, which is, was the driveway permit properly issued, issued by Mr. Malley? And then I sort of heard then the global concern of the neighbors and what I'm trying to figure out is, does that, and I, I'm not meaning to diminish the concerns of the neighbors and all the good people that came out tonight, but does that matter uh, with respect to the issuance of a driveway permit? Well, uh, uh, the, the appeal of that issue. Um, I, think it, I, I mean, it matters, I know, but legally. Let me, let me focus on the specific issue that's here. And, okay. and the issue, I think, is st since Stonegate Road is a public way, why shouldn't Mr. Malley issue an entr entrance permit onto Stonegate Road? Now, in fairness to Mr. Malley, this is, I suggest, an unusual situation. And it's unusual because Stonegate Road is not an ordinary public way. Stonegate Road is different from most other public roads because it is located entirely within the Stonegate subdivision. And it's a public road because it was deeded to the town. And Ms. Stanyeshkin submitted the documentation regarding those deeds. And the deed to the town is conditioned, among other things, on the covenants that apply to Stonegate Road on the covenants that apply to the Stonegate subdivision in its entirety. And those covenants include the obligation of the association to maintain land within the right of way. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, here is the fundamental issue. A permit for entrance onto a public way is, must be done in accordance with all local regulations. That's section 17-2-4 of the ordinances. This public way is within the Stonegate subdivision. 
the, the subdivision ordinances, therefore, should be considered in deciding whether or not a permit ought to be issued. And in particular, local regulation section 16-3-1C, which is within the subdivision ordinances, provides that plants or other types of vegetative cover shall be preserved or placed throughout and around the perimeter of any proposed subdivision. Why? To provide for an adequate buffer to reduce noise and lights and separation between the subdivision abutting properties and enhancement of its appearance. And I suggest to you that the grant of a permit to put a driveway onto Stonegate Road in this instance was not in accordance with local regulation 16-3-1C, but in fact was very much in conflict with that regulation. Um, you, the word is perimeter, uh, so I, I guess I'm, I, I'm not I just want to make sure I understand your point, uh, because I, I think a perimeter is sort of the outline of the subdivision, so it's between the new homes and some existing neighborhood that's on the other side. You're talking about a buffer that runs along Stonegate Road that's in the heart of the subdivision. No, actually, it is part of the perimeter. Here's the plan from May 29, 1992. Okay. I see. Now, that's the entrance. It's the entrance to Stonegate Road, the south entrance that we're talking about. And you'll see that the right of way that is provided in the plan is considerably broader than that which is necessary for the road itself. It provided for a buffer which was at the perimeter of the subdivision. It was separating the subdivision from the land that was owned by a third party at 370 Mitchell Road. Now, that's what the plan provided for. If we, thanks to technology, we can look at Google Earth now and we can see what this area used to look like. It doesn't look like that anymore, but this is what it used to look like. This is what it was provided for. And when you consider that, what you see is that there was a very clear demarcation. There was a natural buffer between the road itself and the edge of the subdivision. And Stonegate, the homeowners association in Stonegate, was required by the covenants to maintain that buffer. And we did so, in part it was natural, in part there were plantings that were in that place. Now, Mr. Steer, yes. I have a question. So this buffer that you're showing here up on the wall uh, over which the association was, was maintaining plantings, is actually private property owned by others, or was it owned by Stonegate at any point, or was between between Stonegate Road and 370 Mitchell? Th that area was part of the Stonegate subdivision, which was deeded to the town, subject to the the conventions, the uh, covenants that apply to Stonegate. So it was deeded to the town, but then the property was sold to someone else? No. Or you're talking just about the, the section close to the road? No, actually, that part, the natural buffer maintained by Stonegate, what's happened is that, let's see if I can point to it. Unfortunately, I can't. Would you like me to, this area right here where it says natural buffer, Right. That's owned by more or less owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. That's right. <clears throat> no, that shows better on the previous. Do you have a previous slide that may help? Uh, previous. One will put out. That. There it is. Right. <coughs> the arrow is pointing 
That's the buffer. That's the right. Answer. And the property that is to be proposed to be developed is on Mitchell Road. To the left. To the left, correct. Exactly. And to, to the, yeah, just to, just to make sure we're all oriented yeah. here. And we're not counting this against your 10 minutes. This rectangular portion was deeded to the town. Okay. Everyone agrees on that? Mm -hmm. Right. To the left of this line is the private property owned by the early bird LLC. So the driveway permit that was issued was to run a driveway across the town owned land to get to Stonegate. To, to get to the area. To get to Stonegate yeah, to Road. To the road. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sure. When you say it was deeded to the town subject to the covenants of the subdivision? Yes. I get that, Gestalt, but what do you mean legally by that? What, what is the legal obligation of the town to adhere to those covenants? And the covenants, I understand, are the buffer and the vegetation and all that. When you deed that, what is there language that um, requires the town to, is the town subordinate to the subdivision rules that have already been put in place when, it, when it's deeded? I don't think that we need to resolve that particular legal issue for you to decide the appeal that's before you, but what I would say is that the deed of the land to the town to serve as a right of way was subject to and conditioned upon the covenants. So when you deed something subject to covenants, the person who receives the property receives it subject to those conditions. So it's as if you, if you buy a home in a subdivision subject to covenants that you have to have your house painted a certain color. That requirement would continue on and affect the title to your property. Um, but you said we don't need to consider that issue, so I'm going to try to make life a little easier for the council. Is the, the, the principal basis then of your appeal the language from Art, Article 16 of the, well, you, you point us to 17-2-4, which has a reference to all local regulations, and then you then point us to the provision in Article 16. Exactly. Uh, are any of the uh, provisions in 17-2-4 that are specifically enumerated, those would include site distance, grade, number, are any of those uh, issues being raised in this appeal? Yes. Okay. Um, do you want me to address that now? If, yes, that would be I mean, great. Because I think, I think it would be helpful to, to first finish the first issue. So let me just explain what we have historically here. We had a plan which set forth a significant portion of land much wider than a natural road. We had the buffer being maintained by Stonegate. You can see it also here. It is a, it, according to documents later that I received today, it, it looks like it's at least 85 feet from the road to the point where the, the property of the adjacent landowner begins. Um, and in spite of the fact that there's the buffer as it used to look, as opposed to the, the version that you saw just a moment ago. Um, but I didn't understand that last point. The, the buffer, we're looking at the buffers to the left? Yes, exactly. This is what the road used to look like. Okay. And, and what's the current? That's what it looks like now. Okay, you can see the driveway is approximately where the sign is located. Okay. Just inside the entrance to Stonegate, which you can see on either side. There's a Stonegate sign on, on either side of this particular picture. Now, what, what you have, if you, if you walk up to that sign and you look to the left, instead of seeing brush and vegetation and the natural buffer that had been there, 
you see this. It's been, the buffer has been destroyed. Well, but that, that house is not in the buffer. That house is 25 feet beyond the property line okay. that we've been talking about. All right. but, but there is no longer any separation between the subdivision and the adjacent property. And it is that fact, the fact that in granting the permit, the requirements of section 16-3-1C, which aim to preserve the integrity of a subdivision by providing for an adequate buffer and separation between subdivision abutting properties, that's been eradicated. And so we in Stonegate are left with what is in effect a property declaring itself to be part of the subdivision when it, when it has none of the obligations or responsibilities or requirements that apply to all the rest of us. And that, that is what is disturbing. Now, David asked about a second basis. And the second basis is that the, the application for entrance permit didn't comply with the specific requirements of Title II, Section 17-2-3. Now, when I prepared this, um, I was working off of the documents that I understood to be the documents that were part of the, the permit. They, they were the documents that were submitted to the council as part of the package by the town manager. I have been told that there are other materials and that in fact a different um, sketch or subdivision plan was given to Mr. Malley at the time that he was asked to approve this. But that subdivision plan suffers from the same problems as the, the, the sketch shown in what I understand to be the application. Uh, namely, it doesn't comply with the specific requirement that the setback be shown in relation to the center line of the traveled way. Now, why is that important? It's important because by failing to show the extent of the buffer that is being destroyed to create this driveway, it minimizes the impact that this new, that this decision to grant the permit for an entrance onto Stonegate Road actually has on the rest of the subdivision. And what we are asking, what I am asking in this appeal is for the council to take a second look at these issues, they're important issues. They apply not just to Stonegate. They apply to any subdivision that has public roads within that subdivision because we're talking about the integrity of property, the value of property that supports our tax base. Um, when in this particular instance also, there is an alternative. The driveway can be located on Mitchell Road. If you go on Mitchell Road, you see that the advertising signs for this particular lot are also located along Mitchell Road. And by requiring the driveway to enter onto Mitchell Road instead of providing a Stonegate access, the council would be maintaining the integrity of the Stonegate development while still permitting the development and marketing of this property and ensuring that the property is being marketed in a way that's not misleading, that doesn't suggest that it 
it's a part of something that it isn't. And for those reasons, I request that the council reverse the decision of Mr. Malley. Just uh, before you sit down, and, and we, this went longer than 10 minutes, but we asked you a lot of questions, so thank you for uh, all of your responses. But in terms of the requirements of 17.2-4, um, are you challenging the, the uh, public works director's findings or conclusions regarding site distance and grade? No. And, okay. Thank you. No. Not on, not on that point. All right. Thank you. Um, before Mr. Sears, any other questions? Jessica? Yes. Are there actually two lots in, in, in this issue? There. Aren't there two? There is one that has been, um, for which the driveway has been approved. There is, in fact, um, there is another lot that is being proposed that is to the, to the right or east of the lot that's currently being developed. So there is, there is a second lot ab above the line for the buffer. That is, that is, jump a little bit. That is also being uh, at least proposed for development. Now, there are reasons why we think that is improper, but I needn't go into those now. But but yes, the my particular appeal deals with the one driveway decision that has been made to date. But but there is reason to believe. <coughs> that this same uh, early bird uh, group is going to try to develop yet another property on the street also seeking a similar driveway access on the Stonegate Road. Now these two lots, um, the, one, the one that's more westerly, I, I drove by there today and was looking, trying to look very carefully at everything. Uh, lot number, um, is, one is Stonegate, number six Stonegate, and the other is number ten Stonegate. Is that correct? That's, that's how they have been described by the developer. Now, are those in fact um, official addresses for Stonegate Road? And, and yes or no, and if, if yes or no, how, is, how does that happen? And I don't yeah. know. Uh, we could let the town manager. Uh, Under the town's addressing ordinance, the chief of police assigned street addresses. Okay. So those uh, street addresses have been assigned? Do you know, Bob, if they have? We believe they have, but I, I can't say 100 percent for sure uh, if the chief has actually assigned them. Okay. I, I, I'm just getting concerned with the time. Uh, are there any other uh, burning questions? Sarah? Just f 15 seconds. It if the driveway is not allowed to go there, would that change the address? Otherwise, it would be sort of absurd. That would be a determination of the chief of police. Thank you. We, we would suggest that it should. Yes, Caitlin. If the driveways don't go onto Stonegate, the property does allow for driveways to be made towards Mitchell Road? Sure. On both properties? I don't know about both properties. Yeah, and, and again, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's necessarily germane to what we're looking at is did the town public works director properly issue the driveway permit, whether there are other alternatives out there. You know, I guess those would have to be explored depending on what we do, but that should not figure into our decision. Okay, thank you, Mr. Steer. Uh, at this point, uh, I would turn it over to or ask the public works director uh, to make a presentation. Good evening. My name is Pat Dunn, and as Mr. Leahy uh, indicated earlier, I'm here tonight representing uh, Mr. Malley. And before he does his presentation, I just wanted to make a couple of brief points. Um, to the council. Um, the ordinance that we're looking at here this evening is under Chapter 17, Article 2, and I believe the standard that you should be applying here is first um, whether the property that is in question abuts a public way. Um, the public works director um, has, is the person that has to grant permits 
um, when someone wants to construct a driveway um, to property that abuts a public way. And once that determination is made, then he must go through those list of criteria to determine whether um, all the factors that are listed um, are in order. Um, and um, I think to aid you, uh, one of the questions that we realized this afternoon when I saw Mr. Steer's presentation, which he kindly sent to me, was that the sketch that was part of that packet really wasn't the sketch that Mr. Uh, Malley was using. Um, he has, has a sketch that um, the applicant provided to him, which I'd like to give to you, as well as the sketch that um, shows the um, distance from the center line of the road to the property, which was another issue um, he raised. And I think it will be helpful for you to have these as part of um, this matter. Thank you. And, and did Mr. Steer get copies of those? I gave him copies when I arrived here this evening. Okay, uh, thank you. Because I didn't realize, as I say, till late today that um, there was a different um, sketch as part of the, of the packet. And I think um, at this point I'll ask Mr. Malley if he will do his presentation and uh, walk you through the process he took in um, reaching his decision to issue the permit on this property. My name is Robert Malley. I'm the Director of Public Works for the Town of Cape Elizabeth. And I'd like to read a statement for you that uh, details uh, my actions leading up to the applicant, application for the permit, and the actual issuance. Excuse me. Uh, might I be permitted to see the thing? Sure. Sure. Do you have extra copies? Sure. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, pursuant to provisions of Chapter 17, Section 17-2 of the Town's Ordinances, a property owner cannot construct a driveway extending from a public way onto the property without having first obtained an entrance permit for the driveway from the Director of Public Works. On Friday, October 22, 2010, I met with Graham Pillsbury, who represents Early Bird Group LLC, on the westerly end of Stonegate Road to review two proposed driveway entrances for two newly created lots. The lots in question both about the public way, public right of way of Stonegate Road. Mr. Pillsbury supplied me with a sketch that showed the approximate entrance locations. Based on my discussion with Mr. Pillsbury on October 22, 2010, and a field review of the sketch provided by Mr. Pillsbury, I told Mr. Pillsbury that I would approve the two proposed entrances subject to the requirements listed in the ordinance. After meeting with Mr. Pillsbury, I also contacted Bruce Smith the town's code enforcement officer to confirm the creation of the lots prior to the issuance of the permit. We also discussed the area being proposed for both driveways and agreed it was within the right of way of Stonegate Road. Following our meeting on October 22, 2010, I told Mr. Pillsbury to move the proposed driveway entrance for lot number one, now number six Stonegate Road, slightly easterly of the location agreed upon in the field. The reason for this relocation was to allow greater distance between the proposed driveway and the intersection with Mitchell Road. Following our discussion about the proposed driveway locations, Mr. Pillsbury and I discussed the potential removal of trees and the trimming of vegetation to accommodate the new entrances. Mr. Pillsbury was instructed which vegetation to save and that which he had permission to remove. Since we were still interviewing applicants for the town for the tree warden's position, I acted in that capacity and authorized the disposition of the trees potentially impacted. On October 28, 2010, I issued a driveway entrance permit 2010-12 to Early Bird Group LLC for 6 Stonegate Road. The application was issued based on their having met the following requirements of the ordinance. Um, uh, section 17-2-3 application. The applicant furnished a sketch which provided the relevant information I needed to consider the application complete. It shows, Excuse me, Mr. Uh, you heard one of the issues raised by Mr. Steer that the application itself was deficient. I can, Could I you can address, address, I can address that? that after I read the statement, or I can address it now, however you'd like to. It, I, it might be helpful to do it now, okay. uh, if you don't mind. Um, my, my position on that is it, it states uh, the, that the sketch show the setbacks 
setback of building, location of existing pipes, et cetera, list culverts, location of new pipes. And at the end of that sentence, it's a very important uh, two words that say, if required. Some of these driveway entrances are pro forma, some aren't. Some require more detail than others. And my position on that is that the setback of building uh, to the property line is an issue that's uh, verified by the code enforcement officer. When he issues the building permit, he is the one that verifies the setbacks from the property line. It's not critical that I know that unless someone is proposing, say, a garage on the edge of the road that may be within the right-of-way. But nevertheless, they would have to get a building permit for that. And I do not issue building permits that's done through code enforcement. And Bruce Smith would have to verify those setbacks. But I guess I'm looking at Section 17-2-3. And it refers to, uh, this is language that was underlined in Mr. Steer's presentation, the setback of the building in relation to the center line of the traveled way. And then I'm looking at this drawing that Attorney Dunn gave to the council, which has a measurement from what appears to be the center of Stonegate Road uh, to a square, and I don't know what that is. It says proposed dwelling. So I guess my question is, 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 is this document, in, does it do what this ordinance or the section that, says? The document that you have is what was given to the code enforcement officer for the issuance of the building permit, okay. which shows the setback from the property line. Okay, so this document then was not provided to you in That's your correct. decision? I period. received that today. Okay, so this was not part of your decision-making process. That's correct. Okay, thanks. So, in other words, you did not have then the information that Mr. Steer says you should have had, and I understand your explanation, but you didn't have uh, any piece of paper that showed the distance between the center line of the travel way and the setback of the building. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on that point? Would you like me to read down through the other requirements? Please, yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. That's fine. Um, excuse me. Site distance. Uh, Section 17-2-4, Part A. Site distance measurements based on the sketch provided were taken. Based on my calculations, I found the location selected met the minimum requirements referenced in the subdivision ordinance in Section 17-3-2, Part A, uh, 1. Thomas Errico, professional engineer with the firm of T.Y. Lynn International, performed a second site distance measurement on December 2nd, 2010, at my request. Currently, the driveway entrance is not well defined as construction vehicles are entering and leaving the site. As a result, the driveway has not been properly laid out or prepared for gravel or pavement. Mr. Errico recommended that the actual driveway be located so that the minimum standard is met. Section 17-2-4, Part B, grade. The existing grade and the location proposed for the entrance drive was visually inspected on site, appeared to be well within the allowable entry grade referenced for single resident driveways in the subdivision ordinance. Although the finished grade for the driveway for 6 Stonegate Road is not yet established, it currently meets the criteria referenced, which in parentheses 6% max for 10 feet, in section 16-3-2 part A, 10 of the town's ordinances. Todd Gammon of AMEC Engineers took the elevations on the existing entry grade on December 2nd, 2010, and concluded that once completed, both driveways should meet the ordinance criteria that the first 10 feet of driveway cannot exceed a 6% slope. Section 17-2-4 Part C, number, is not applicable to this permit. Section 17-2-4 Part D, sidewalk and curbs. The reference to sidewalks is not applicable. Uh, in the past, the town has given the option to the property owner of keeping or removing curbing if in place at the end of the driveway. The curbing can create a noticeable bump for vehicles and can also be an obstruction for a snowplow. If they choose to remove the curbing, we suggest to them that an asphalt berm be installed if needed when they put the finished surface layer of pavement on the driveway. This allows surface water to sheet flow past the driveway entrance. Section 17-2-4 Part E, Drainage. Surface water will continue to flow in the curb line. No ditches are being impacted or culvert required. Uh, finally, section 17-2-4, part F, paving. 
The ordinance requires that the first 10 feet be paid from the edge of the existing traveled way. Uh, it is assumed that the entire driveway will be paved upon completion of the residence. If not, the town will require the paving is noted above prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. While I had discussions with Mr. Pillsbury in regards to number 10 Stonegate Road, lot number two is referenced in your sketch. No entrance permit has been requested as of this date. As I have personally stated, I issued driveway entrance permit 2010-12 after determining that the applicant early bird group had or would meet all of the requirements of the ordinance to obtain the permit. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Bob? Jessica. Uh, I'm not sure if these are for Mr. Malley, but one of the things that Mr. Steer mentioned that he felt that the permit was in conflict with 16-3-1. And I'm trying to find that in my stack here, and I, I wonder if anyone has that wording, that we could review that. I can get there in a second. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, Mr. Mr. Stewart actually quoted it in his in his okay. presentation. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. You have that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just I, I, go ahead. Just one point of clarification. Yes. Uh, in the reference to local regulations in section 17-2-4, condition of permit, it does reference all local regulations. <laughs> But it doesn't cross-reference that section in the subdivision ordinance. And I don't know if that's pertinent or not, but it doesn't cross-reference, so the two ordinances are not connected by a cross-reference. Do you, I don't know if, the, 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 if you would have an understanding as to what that is referring us to. I don't know if, if Mr. Leahy wanted to weigh in on that issue. Yes, and, I, and the reason I'd like to do that is because we only received this information from Mr. Steer today, so I didn't know this was going to be an issue. That's a subdivision ordinance as it exists today. Uh, I don't know if that's what existed in 1987 through 92 when this was approved. It is a standard for the planning board to apply in reviewing a subdivision application. It's one of you know, numerous um, requirements and it, you know, it begins with um, general standards of subdivision design. So presumably, some version of this that existed at the time of the Stonegate application was the basis for which the planning board approved the subdivision. Um, and we do, have not seen uh, any restriction placed upon this area, the so-called buffer area, either on a plan or in any other fashion in the deed uh, to the town. So I just want to say this is coming out. It is a regulation of the town. I don't know if this existed when the planning board approved it. It was a standard to, um, to, uh, upon which the planning board should have reviewed. It goes, I mean, the next one is off street parking and proposed roads should be laid out and so forth. This is a whole list of uh, numerous uh, standards um, that the planning board should have, uh, should have utilized if that was applicable back in the time when this was approved. Uh, I just had a question for uh, Mr. Malley. Uh, the, the driveways are going, the proposed driveways, which you issued the permit for driveway, I'm sorry, is going over town-owned land? That's my, that's my interpretation. It's part of the public right-of-way of Stonegate Road. And given that you were issuing a permit that would be in the Stonegate neighborhood, although not officially, as part of that approved subdivision. Um, did you give any consideration uh, to uh, notice or getting input from people that live within that neighborhood? There's no provision in the town ways ordinance which requires public notification of a driveway entrance permit. You could have a vacant lot, say, within the subdivision. If they petitioned or applied for a driveway permit, we've never had to give public notice of that application. And there's, there's not a provision in the ordinance that covers that, and we've never had to do that. And there was, so that, does that answer your, your question? And getting back to the 
uh, measurement from the center line of the public way to the building envelope. Um, Mr. Steer gave an explanation as to why that was important or critical. Uh, did you obtain in information that would have addressed issues that Mr. Steer had raised in terms of your work on no, this? No, I mean, I, again, that's a, to me, that's an issue that is the code enforcement officer determine if the lot and the dwelling meets the proper setback from the property line. I don't make that determination. Okay. Does anybody else have any more questions for Mr. Malley? Thank you. Uh, I know there are a lot of people here from uh, the Stonegate neighborhood. I recognize a lot of faces out there. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any information to add that speaks to the issue of the driveway permit. So I, I, if you do, you are welcome to come and speak. Uh, but if, if it's, it, it would need to be focused on that issue um, because that is the, the appeal that we're dealing with tonight. Oh, yes, and I did also, I did mention Early Bird LLC. I, I believe a representative is here. It, did, you, did you, sir, want to offer anything at this point? Just one thing. Okay. I'm Grant Pillsbury. I'm half owner of Early Bird LLC, Early Bird Group LLC. I'm a half owner of the property. And I just want to really clarify, um, it didn't seem clear to me sitting in here, the 25 foot setback, the issue of the, you know, the center line thing you kept talking about. Um, I'd like to see, can I see the documents that you were given? I just want to make sure that it's clear what, what Bob Malley saw. Uh, uh, Attorney Dunn, what is it that we're supposed to be looking at? Well, it's you're all I, on the same page. Yes, I just um, gave him the two, yeah. the two uh, sketches that I gave to the council. Okay. I don't know which one he wants to refer to. Okay. But the one, well, this one, that it shows Stonegate Road and Mitchell Road and then the buffer, if you will. Right. Uh, this was given to the code enforcement officer and not to Mr. Malley, correct? No. And that I think one was given to Mr. Malley. Oh. Is that which one are you looking at? Well, one, one is a hand-drawn one that shows the driveways. Yeah, let's, let, let, we probably do need to be a bit better about creating a record. Yes. Uh, this document, these are the two that you gave us today. Yes. Tonight. Uh, and then we have another, and this at the top is Mitchell Road. There's a fax uh, notation. It's been faxed December 13th at 4.33 p.m. That's, that? that's, the that's the code enforcement officer document. Okay, so that's Exhibit 1, uh, Mali Exhibit 1, and then this one that says not to scale at the top, uh, and uh, yes. yeah, we'll call that Mali Exhibit 2. So with that clarification. Yep. Exhibit 1. Mal Bob Malley, the one you did see this. I just want to clarify, you did see this in your decision making, correct? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Malley, can you clarify that again? Because I thought your presentation. The was sketch wrong. that was provided to me by Mr. Pillsbury is, is this sketch here. That's the one that you provided me. Just Malley exhibit two. Yes, this is what was provided to the code enforcement officer, and he faxed me a copy of that today. That's what you yep. supplied. Okay. Uh, yep. And I just, but I just want to make sure that there's, there was a there was a drawing on the slideshow that Mr. Steer had that showed a the lot with a 25 foot setback. But I just want to make sure it's clear that that 25 foot setback was to property line, not to Stonegate Road. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we had to be set back from property line 20 feet. It's actually 25 feet. And then the, the town owned parcel is where the driveway crosses. I just want to make sure that was clear. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, why don't we see, is there anybody else who wanted to speak before we return to Mr. Steer? Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi. My name is Bill Orcutt. I've lived in Stonegate since 1989. I own property 
adjacent to the property you're speaking on. And until three weeks ago, I had no clue of what was going on. I have owned the lot, I believe I bought it in 1992, that is not built on yet. I pay my taxes, I pay my dues to the association every year. They're good people. But I have a lot, but I have certain rules that I have to abide by, by them. And yet these people come in and do nothing and have the access to our community. I just want you to weigh that in consideration. I still have an empty lot. And hopefully I'll build on it soon. That's all I need to say. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak on the issue of the issuance of the driveway permit? Okay. Uh, we've been doing this, uh, we've spent a fair bit of time on this already. Uh, on the other hand, I see Mr. Sear had raised his hand. And I think it, I would be inclined to allow a, a sort of a brief, brief presentation. Is that okay with the rest of the council? Okay. I just, I just have a very few points I'd like to make. First, it is now undisputed that when Mr. Malley made his decision, he did not have the information that he was required to consider, namely the amount of setback to the center of Stonegate Road in issuing his permit. So there is a, a deficiency, an admitted deficiency. Now he says that's something the code enforcement officer has to deal with. But this, the ordinance itself provides that that is information that must be taken into account by the director of public works in issuing a permit for entrance. So it's clear and undisputed that there was non-compliance with that particular aspect of this procedure. The other point that I want to address is uh, the statement that the deed to the town by Stonegate did not contain any limitations or restrictions. And that's contradicted by the information that you have in your packet, which is an attachment to Rachel Stanyeshkin's declaration. Page six of that declaration shows the warranty deed to the town dated December 5, 1989. It's the deed by which Stonegate Associates gave the land to the town of Cape Elizabeth. And it says in the third paragraph of that deed, this conveyant is subject to a declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions recorded in the Registry of Deeds. Subject to all notes, conditions, and easements shown on the plan, and so on. So it's clear that in fact, when Stonegate Associates did give the land to the town as a public way, that incorporated the declarations which provided that the association would continue to maintain the land in the right of way that was not being maintained by the town for the road. And that's what we've done for 20 years um, until that land, without notice to us, was suddenly stripped of its vegetation. Those are my only points. Thank you. What's that? Do you want a motion? Um, why don't we take a motion and then get a second, then we can have a discussion. Yes, go ahead, Sarah. 
Um, I move the council uphold the request issued by Robert H. Steyer, Jr. of 9 Rockcrest Drive to appeal the decision of the Director of Public Works to issue a driveway entrance permit for 6 Stonegate Road. And the motion has been made to grant the appeal of Mr. Steer. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Well, we, any discussion? Could, just. Yeah. Could we just um, organize our thoughts on, on, we've gotten a lot of information and it's um, a little confusing. And I wonder, can we please first look at uh, the, the permit requirement again with the ordinance, have a brief discussion on that. Um, I'm, I would like to review the setback issue a little bit as well. Um, we have several sketches and um, I just want to review that. Sure. Uh, Sarah. I'm just curious, are we allowed to do that? Well. Isn't this sort of legal? Like, are we allowed to rehash this without then getting corrections and input and I'll ask our town attorney. I mean, we are now in the deliberative phase of this appeal. But are we allowed to try to clarify with each other? I, I'm, I'm planning to, to offer my two cents. So yeah, I think we need to. I help. think you can discuss, discuss the points we made. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and just in the interest of full disclosure, we, we do have proposed findings that don't say yay or nay to the appeal, but sort of walk us through uh, sort of how to get from point A to point B, but then sort of for the meat of the issue, we have to make a decision as to whether we're going to uh, find that, that the permit was properly issued or not. Uh, but it does seem that the sole, the, 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 not the sole issue, but a main argument that Mr. Steer has raised is that the application was somehow deficient. Not that any of the findings relating to compliance with Section 17-2-4 were somehow deficient, but that the application that started the process was somehow deficient. And I, I, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding why that would be a basis to uphold an appeal. But I'm, I'm willing to hear what everybody else has to say. Uh, but anyway. Tom, did you want to offer? I, I just, I mean, I, I think that's um, the appellant's point of view, and I think what Ms. Malley said, if I heard him correctly, was that he reads the end of that provision, if required, to grant him discretion in different cases to take, to look at those foregoing um, submissions. In some cases, they're required. All of them are required, or some of them are required. That's what I heard him say, and that he visited the site. Uh, saw where the entrance was going to be, said move it down five feet, and had that sight distance confirmed by someone. So he felt, I think what he said was he felt he had done what he had to do on site uh, to determine um, the re re requirements. He, he, that's, my, that's what I heard him say. Okay. Does anybody have questions about that particular issue concerning the application? Sarah, or um. anything else? I heard, I thought I heard from Mr. Steyer that it, the issue was actually bigger than the process of the application itself and how it might have been potentially incomplete. I thought he was trying to make the point that um, the content of the application was also questionable given um, the pre-existing rules that govern how you manage the land on a um, subdivision would somehow override or weigh into uh, town owned property. So I, I guess I don't agree with you that the only issue is how the application was considered. Well, I think the other issue was Mr. Steer's reliance on 16 3 1 that talks about plants and other types of vegetative cover. And what Section 17 does is it lays out one, two, three, four, five, six requirements for conditions uh, of a permit for a driveway. Site distance, grade, number, sidewalk and curbs, drainage, paving. None of those are in play here, is my understanding. Uh, that Mr. Sear is not challenging that, but what he is challenging is the introductory sentence of 17-2-4 that the location, design, and construction of any entrance permit permitted shall be in accordance with all local regulations. 
and then he points us to section 16-3-1C that talks about plants and other types of vegetative cover uh, shall be preserved or placed throughout around the perimeter of any proposed subdivision to provide for an adequate buffer. And so I, I am assuming what the argument here is that by granting the driveway permit, the code enforcement, excuse me, the public works director uh, did not ensure that it would comply with 16-3-1. So, so I think that is the, the I mean, they're, they're, I'm not going to say one significant or not significant, but that's the, I guess, more substantive issue that he's raised. The other one, in my view, is a procedural one. It's still important, but I think those are the two issues. Mm -hmm. So it, just to recap, so <clears throat> in his application process, going by current ordinance, the the applicant met its requirements, but Mr. Malley, according to Mr. Steer, did not review the 16-2-3 um, or the, and, and ultimately the, uh, the deed, the warranty deed situation with Stonegate to the town. And that seems to be part of the argument as well. Yeah, and, and I guess if I could weigh in on, on that, the, the declaration, uh, right. Uh, was referenced in the deed to the town for that area of land. Yes. But it would seem to me that the declaration does not prohibit uh, the, it, it imposes an obligation on the association to maintain the area, but it, it doesn't necessarily say what can happen there. And it would seem to me that if the declarant, the developer of Stonegate, had wanted to ensure that this would be pristine and never touched uh, you know, with driveways or any sort of structure or anything, it could have so provided, but it didn't. So I think from Mr. Malley's standpoint, he didn't see a basis, or it wasn't presented to him, but there wouldn't have been a basis for him on the declaration language alone to say, oh, gee, I can't do this, because the association has a right to maintain this. But that's my position. You, you may disagree with me. I'm just not sure that that issue is in play with respect to this appeal. I think it is. <coughs> In, in an appeal before the zoning board or, or not? Uh, because there, there are sort of concurrent proceedings. Yes, right? just for the members of the, of the council, there is an appeal before the zoning board of appeals of the issuance of the building permit. And two grounds stated, therefore, would be that the action of dividing the parcel at issue here into three lots, the house plus two lots, uh, would require planning board approval. That's their argument. The other argument, the flip side would be that it doesn't under an exemption in this state law and our municipal ordinance. Second argument on appeal is that the allowance of the driveway causes an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision, even if it's within the town right away. And that amendment needs to be approved by the planning board, even if it's not by Stonegate developer or Stonegate residents that the, in effect, this, the entry of the driveway into the public way of Stonegate right away amends that earlier subdivision. So they said there's two reasons why a building permit should not have been issued, and they're questioning that of the code enforcement officer, and that's scheduled for December 28th at the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm going to make a suggestion, and I'm not sure it's a good idea. But there are actually, a, although you would say a driveway permit, it, it wouldn't create so many issues. There do seem to be a number of issues that have been raised. Uh, we're basically acting like a panel of judges trying to figure this out on the fly without the benefit. Uh, uh, and I know Mr. Steer was away, so we, we just got his presentation this afternoon. Uh, but we don't know the benefit of uh, what judges might normally get, which would be a brief. Uh, with their written arguments so that we would have a chance to sort of um, mull this over and, and give a thorough consideration to the arguments. I don't know if we have authority to do that. Um, if we did and folks were interested, then... There, there are no limitations on the council's authority in how you deal with this. Oh. <laughs> Except we want to get to the right results. So, uh, 
Tom, what you, uh, as a town attorney, uh, do you have any other thoughts or suggestions? Well, only that this is, seems important. There's a lot of people out here tonight, and we did get this this afternoon, as did um, okay. the attorney for Mr. Malley. So certainly within your discretion to table this and to uh, set a deadline to receive further information, if you wish, from any, uh, either the two parties or three parties to this appeal. What are folks' what are folks thoughts? I'm definitely in favor of that, of that, given the volume of information we've just received. But I do have another question, and it's brief. <laughs> Would it, and I, maybe this is to uh, the town manager, I don't know, but it, it seems that, I mean, that there are a lot of issues coming into play. It, it, would it be, or let's just, let me ask, has it ever been the usual practice of the Director of Public Works upon issuing a driveway permit to then be required to review of any, in, any, in any established neighborhood to review warrant uh, deed declarations and easements and so forth. I mean, it seems like that is perhaps beyond his pur purview. I mean, I don't know. Or has it ever happened before? Is there any precedence for this? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair? I, I mean, I, my understanding is we're sort of an, an unchartered territory, but do you have any the, information that would be helpful? I, I could if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I know at times the director over the years, not just Bob, but his predecessor, has had to look at certain properties particularly to make sure that there's proper right title and interest in it. Uh, that, that has come up from time to time, but usually that's something that Bob, you know, if there was an issue, would refer it to the town attorney. Someone could claim that they don't have proper title, something like that. Uh, that I, it, it's it, extremely rare, but it could happen. But generally, he doesn't have to review the subdivision plans. He applies the standards that are in this ordinance. And, and the Stone, Stonegate is an association, but, but of course, but the Stonegate Road is a public way. It is not a private road. It's a public road. Correct. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I, go ahead, sir. Yes. It seems to me that the issues here, I get that it's very narrow and it's limited and it's legal and that's what we're supposed to weigh in on, but there's actually many larger issues here that feel like it's beyond the purview of the council. Or maybe it's not. But I feel really uncomfortable having four counselors <laughs> decide this issue. Um, so, because I know it's supposed to be limited and narrow, but to me, it isn't. So I guess I'm in favor of tabling it, and I'm not so in favor of coming back with four counselors again. <laughs> Although there may be nothing we can do about that. Yeah, I, Maybe I, the recusal um, rules need to be lightened up a little bit. Well, I think that we've already voted on that motion, so uh, I, I don't know if it would be appropriate to, to get folks back on this side of the podium. But, well, not for now. But. Yeah, but it, I've, got, I've got a concern if we don't decide tonight, all these good people have shown up and we've heard a lot of arguments and dark, we should just make the decision. Uh, the town attorney did outline proposed findings and conclusions. I think if we walk through... I'm just uh, looking at the clock, trying to figure out how much other things we have to do. But we could walk through these, and you might start to get a more, more of a comfort level. I'm that, comfortable. I'm, I can, that, I that, gee, I can make the decision tonight. And if, if not, and we feel like briefing is needed, then we can do that. Or would folks be willing to go forward and looking at these proposed findings? Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, hand these out. And we should just vote. Well, we need to actually make specific findings uh, to create a record in the event of an appeal. So we, we do need to, and this shouldn't take too long. Um, Mr. Sear, do you have these? I do not. Would you like a copy? I sure would. Do you have one now? Okay. Yes. These are findings, conclusions, and decision of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council relating to the driveway permit appeal. Permit appeal. Uh, Early Bird LLC is the permittee. The property in question is tax map U31 lot 9D. 
On Monday, December 13, 2010, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council heard the appeal of Robert Steer, Jr. of 9 Rock Crest Drive regarding a driveway permit issued, number 2010-12, by Public Works Director Robert C. Malley for 6 Stonegate Road, which is ta tax map U31 lot 9D. The Town Council makes the following findings of fact, conclusions, and decision. Findings of fact. The owner of 6 Stonegate Road, tax map U31 line, lot 9D, here and after the property is Early Bird Group LLC, the owner. Graham Pillsbury acts as the owner's authorized member. Number two, on October 28, 2010, Public Works Director Robert Malley issued a driveway permit for the property, permit number 2010-12, which connects to Stonegate Road, a public road within the Stonegate subdivision. On November 27, 2002, Robert Steer, Jr. of 9 Rockcrest Drive, the appellant, filed an appeal of this permit consisting of an email notification of appeal. Mr. Steer's property is located within the Stonegate subdivision. The council was provided with the following documents prior to the December 13, 2010 hearing. A memorandum from Robert Malley dated December 3, 2010 regarding issuance of the subject driveway permit. An email from Thomas Errico, a traffic engineering director at T.Y. Lynn International, dated December 3, 2010, regarding site distance measurements and requirements for the subject driveway. An email from Todd Gammon, a civil engineer with AMEC Earth and Environmental, uh, dated December 2, 2010, regarding the grading of the subject driveway. Two sketches showing the proposed driveway. A statement of Rachel Samiezkin, president of the Stonegate Homeowners Association, dated December 2, 2010, regarding the substance of this appeal. A copy of the Stonegate Phase II subdivision plan and south entrance detail. The deed of Stonegate Road from Stonegate Associates to the town of Cape Elizabeth. Portions of the declaration of the Stonegate Homeowners Association and a PowerPoint presentation from the appellant regarding the substance of this appeal. In addition, we received uh, Mali Exhibits 1 and 2. Notice of this appeal was provided to the property owner on what date? Do we know what date? I think our date. Two minutes. All right, well, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll say notice what of the appeal has been provided to the property owner, and we'll clarify the date. The following members of the Town Council recu recuse themselves from participation in this hearing and decision. Anne Swift Kayata, Frank Governale, and James Walsh. The driveway that is a, number seven, excuse me, the driveway that is the subject of the challenge permit connects with Stonegate Road. Stonegate Road is a public way conveyed to Cape Elizabeth by Stonegate Associates by warranty deed dated December 5, 1989, and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds at Book 9015, page 16. Stonegate Associates recited in its deed of Stonegate Road that the conveyance was subject to a declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Number eight, under Article 3 of the Declaration of the Stonegate Homeowners Association, the association shall be responsible for maintaining, repairing, and replacing stone walls and landscaping within the road rights of way where such maintenance is not the responsibility of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Number nine, the grant of Stonegate Road by Stonegate Associates to the town is approximately 135 feet wide from its entrance at Mitchell Road back through, area at, back through the area at issue in this appeal. The paved Stonegate Road is approximately 30 feet wide with vegetation on both sides. Number 10, the driveway at issue is laid over approximately 25 feet of the owner's property and approximately 70 feet of vegetation in the Stonegate Road right-of-way before connecting with the paved road. Number 11, the owner submitted sketches to the Public Works Director which showed the proposed location, width, and arrangement of the entrance of the proposed driveway onto Stonegate Road and the setback of the building in relation to the center of Stonegate Road. Actually, we need to clarify that. Um, I think what, how number 11 should read is we just delete the and the setback language, correct? So number 11. Would you repeat that, Dave? Yeah, number 11 would be the owner submitted sketches to the public works director which show the proposed location, width, and arrangement of the entrance of the proposed driveway onto Stonegate Road. 
period. The council was provided with the following additional testimony and evidence on December 13, 2010. We heard from Mr. Steer, who uh, gave a PowerPoint presentation and responded to several questions of the town council. We heard from Public Works Director Robert Malley, who read a written statement to the council and also responded to questions from members of the council. Uh, we also heard from Mr. Orcutt, who is a resident of the Stonegate neighborhood. Uh, and we also received uh, statements or advice or guidance from the town attorney, Tom Leahy. And we also heard from uh, Attorney Dunn on behalf of Robert Malley. And Mr. Pillsbury. Thank you. And Mr. Pillsbury on behalf of Early Bird LLC. So in terms of the findings of fact that, that I've recited, numbers 1 through 12, those sort of lay out how we got here. Are, is the council comfortable with those findings of fact so far? OK. We're, um, should we then have a motion to approve these findings of fact? I so move. Second. All those in favor of approving these findings of fact. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Now in the conclusions, and, and by the way, we're not necessarily limited to the four sets of conclusions that are laid out here. The town attorney has made an effort to anticipate what the issues ought to be, but certainly if anybody on the council has a question about that or wants to make sure something's included here, uh, please speak up. So we should just go through these one at a time, yes. Tom? Yes. Okay. Conclusions. Driveway permits are governed by the ordinances of Cape Elizabeth, section 17-2-1 through 17-2-5. Based on the record evidence presented to the council and the council's findings of fact thereon, the council voted as follows. A, the appellant made a timely appeal to the town council of driveway permit number 2010-12. Are folks prepared to vote on that issue of timeliness of the appeal? Okay, all those in favor of that finding or that conclusion? Okay, so it's voted four to zero, the appeal the town council was timely. B, the appellant has demonstrated that driveway permit number 2010-12 fails to meet the following specific ordinances of the ordinance governing, excuse me, I, I, I got stumbled there. Let me say that again. B, the appellant has demonstrated that driveway permit number 2010-12 fails to meet the following specific provisions of the ordinance governing driveway permits. Tom. Just for clarification, because you have that in writing in front of you, that's supposed to be so you could say none, or you could say what it failed to meet. That line is for you, to whoever moves this, to say none or what it is. And it would be appropriate for us to have then, we ought to have a discussion about that before we take a vote on this, this issue. Uh, so is anybody on the council of the belief that any of the provisions set forth in 17-2, no. I'm sorry. Dash two, one through five. Okay, one through five. We're not satisfied. I'm sorry. What one through five are you talking about? Well, if we look at uh, section 17-2 of the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance. Sorry, not to interrupt you, but why not look at 16-3-1? I think that would get... Go ahead, Caitlin. That kind of gets put into 17-2-4. So when you look at section 17-2-4, where you have to be in compliance with all, regu all local regulations, that's when you then go to section 16-3-1C. That's how that gets pulled in. I think that's exactly right. Thank you. 
Uh, well, let's just go through 17-2. And if uh, uh, the section 17-2-1, uh, I don't believe that's implicated here. That just talks about an entrance permit being required. Mm -hmm. Section 17-2-2, again, relates to the town being held harmless. That's not really in play here. The first issue that Mr. Steer raised is 17-2-3. Uh, this relates to the, the claimed deficiency of the application. And so does the driveway permit fail to meet the requirements set forth for an application for a driveway permit? And if we heard, I believe Mr. Malley's argument or position was that language, if required by the Director of Public Works, gives him some discretion as to what he would require in the application. Any thoughts or comments on that issue? Yes, Caitlin. So it's Mr. Malley's claim that it's not his necessarily responsibility to look at the driveway application in relation to the center line of the traveled way. That's the code enforcement officer's responsibility. Is there anything that states that that is the code enforcement officer's responsibility that would make it not required by the Director of Public Works? The only response that I can give is that this section is in the section relating to driveway permits, and it says specifically in there right. what the elements of the application are. So although I understand Mr. Malley's argument, that it may have more, may be more germane to the code enforcement officer in terms of issuing a building permit, the requirement's there. And so mm -hmm. I, I think the issue comes down to that last clause, if required by the Director of Public Works, if, if that would give Mr. Malley discretion not to require that. And I guess I also get to the issue of if all of the conditions of the permit are satisfied, does a claim defect in the, in the actual application then matter? Um, do, should we just take a, we need to, if we think there are defects, if the majority believes that it failed to meet the provisions of the ordinance governing driveway permits, and there are at least three of us who feel that way, then I would add that in. To, we would need to add that into our, is that correct, Tom? I mean. It, What's the best way to, to do this? If, if three of us say the application was defective and therefore didn't comply with 17-2-3, is, is this the anticipated section? To yeah, I, I believe so. I think B, you would say at the end of B, um, fails me in that it failed to, that the uh, public works director failed to uh, receive uh, Required uh, sketch in regard to the center line. Uh, I, I believe he did. That he. I believe he was not provided with sufficient and correct information when he made the decision. Not that it was his fault, but he didn't have the, center. the most up to date and correct uh, uh, description and sketch. So the application, by failing to include the distance from the uh, Center line and the dwelling unit, or the center line and what? The lot. And the lot line? I don't have. Didn't have the proper sketch. It must it's the uh, setback of the building in relation to the center line of the traveled way. Setback of the building, et cetera, gas pumps, et cetera, in relation to the center line of the traveled way. But I, I, I guess I just, the way I look at this, I don't understand why that matters if Mr. Malley went through the conditions of the permit and confirmed site distance grade and all these other issues here. Uh, I don't know if the absence of that one piece of information uh, would render his determination that a permit was proper. Because uh, that's part of the information that's required to issue the permit. Okay. Well, how do other folks feel? Well, that's the other thing. Is how do you know what uh, the language in this, how do you know what's required? It says, it lists all of these things, and then it says, if required by the Director of Public Works. Well, what, what are the documents out there that sets 
what's required by the director. I mean, is, is there something somewhere that says he's only required to look at one thing? You know, we don't have enough I th definition. I, th I think what that language does is it gives the director of public works some discretion into what he's going to require. So the fact that he didn't require that piece of information, I don't think renders the application deficient. But that's your interpretation. You're guiding the discussion. No, that is my interpretation. And that's exactly what we're trying to do up here. So. But she has a question. and. I mean, in other words, there's a lot of legal questions that you're taking liberty to answer in a way that you interpret. I, well, I, do we need to ask them to brief the issue then? I mean, that, that, that's the, the rub. We're being asked to make these conclusions. I mean, I, I'm prepared to move forward, but if people are feeling like we're, we're not in a position to, to make that determination, I'm certainly willing to allow for a briefing. But if folks feel like they're ready, I mean, disagree with me or not, I don't. I mean, I care, but I mean, I guess, to make a vote. I guess I feel like we should have less discussion and vote or way more discussion. But this level of discussion makes me uncomfortable because people are turning to you, asking your questions, and you're giving your interpretation of it. And then that stands as the answer. And other people might disagree with you. So I think we should yeah. vote without any discussion, or we should table this for a whole lot more discussion. Well, what if we just move on from 17-2-3 and look at 17 dash 2-4, because if our discussion leads that it fails at that as well, then 17-2-3 is kind of... Right, and if it turns out that 17-2-3 is the only issue and we want to have that issue brief, then we could do that. So, so we'll, we'll put a place mark by 17-2-3. 17-2-4, yeah, uh, are there any issues there. That, that's where I get issues raised, where you bring in the local regulation section 16-3-1C. I mean, if he's, it says right in 17-2-4 that he's supposed to, the public works director, Mr. Malley, is supposed to look at in accordance with all local regulations. Well, if all local regulations include section 16-3-1C, then it's required to have plants and other vegetative cover surrounding the perimeter of the subdivision, which issuing this permit no longer allows for. I, I agree with Caitlin. Uh, and I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, actually. No, so the question is just a statement of fact, I think. Well, all right, so if, if, if three of you, uh, if, if we have three people that feel that that 16, that the language of 17-2-3, I'm sorry. It's a lot of numbers. Uh, uh, where's the reference to? Oh, the introductory language of 17-2-4, the in accordance with all local regulations, if we have three of us who believe that this permit did not comply with that, then, then this appeal would be granted. Actually, I think Ms. Attorney Lee said that um, if we had two, right? How would it? So I don't know if it's a, if it's two if it's would not overdo it. If it's a tie, what's the result? The appeal doesn't go through. The appeal is not right. Granted, so the, the permit stands. Right. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. You know, I I looked at that language in the in the subdivision ordinance, and if you read it literally. If we'd never, you know, you look, first of all, you have to say, what is the perimeter of a subdivision? And it's being said that the perimeter of the subdivision is, in essence, the, ed the edge of the right of way of the road. If you hold to that, and then you say you can never remove vegetation along that perimeter, you could never put in a single driveway in a subdivision in Cape Elizabeth if you held to that standard. So I, I think you, you, you need to be real careful how you read that and how you look at it. You, you also look at that standard, and that standard relates to new subdivisions. And I, you know, the town's never taken the position over the years that the, sub, the buffer requirements are in place in perpetuity. Uh, it's the responsibility of the developer to put those in place. Many, many things happen over the years that the, that the buffers change. But in this case, the particular issue is what is the perimeter and the ability to remove vegetation in that. And you know, if you say that regulation can't be followed, 
you know, in, in, in essence, you're almost giving direction to, to the, the director of public works. You can't issue any driveway permit <coughs> along the edge of a road uh, if that's the per if it's part of subdivision, uh, if it if it's going to interrupt any vegetation. May I, may I just go ahead, sir? That? This is a slightly different situation because this is not a house, another house that was included in the plan for the subdivision requesting a driveway, which would be an entirely different proposition about the buffer because the assumption would be A, it had been planned for, and B, it would be replaced. This is something that is not part of the subdivision. So it's, it's I, I differ a little bit with your interpretation because this is a unique or very unusual situation in which the buffer actually then does play a more important role because this house was not, is not and was not part of the subdivision and it's coming in 20 years later. So you're right, but, but. Well, look, if I might briefly respond, you want to have it both ways. At one point you want, you want to apply a provision as, as if it was a perimeter of subdivision and then the next thing you're not saying it's not part of the subdivision, so that doesn't apply. It, there's an inconsistency there. It, no, I'm, 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 I'm if, consistently if, saying it's not part of if, it. If I may, um, I think we've identified two issues that are at least causing some council members to say that the appeal ought to be sustained. So that's 17-2-3, the application, and then this, in accordance with all local regulations, 16-3-2 are the two sort of points that could be included in part B of our legal conclusions, correct? Is there anything else? I guess I, I was not aware of any other issues in terms of sight distance, grade, and all that stuff. Well, the other thing that bothers me is the, and I, is the, uh, the relationship of the, the declaration. And I, I feel like I'd like to have a, have some kind of briefing on that. I mean, we are in uncharted territory, but the way I read it, it does discuss what look like what looks like some pretty significant changes. And that, and I just, I mean, I, I, I'm having a little trouble with that. And I, I, I feel like I need a little more time. I think I, is can we revisit this? Um, We're not here to bring up. Yeah, Tom, would I know. it be appropriate? It, could we move into a, it seems to me like the council is struggling on sort of what's the best way to go forward here. Could we have a brief session with you uh, and we would then need, we'd need to make a motion to go into executive session? To discuss the rights and duties with the town attorney. Yeah. yeah. Would folks like to do that for just five minutes? But can I just point out that after 10.30 we're not allowed to bring up new items, so all the people here for other things, will we just do that next council meeting? Or? We, can, we can waive the council rules if we have enough folks who are willing to go forward, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we could suspend those rules, and I, my inclination would be to do that just to get through it. But I'd like to suggest that we, so it's a, bit, a fair bit of floundering going on right now, and that's no, no one's fault. It's just this is a bit complicated, and I'd like to talk to the town attorney about how best to proceed. So, you need a motion for a new executive session in compliance from Title I, Section 405, some letter, uh, to dis discuss uh, confidential, to get advice from the municipal attorney. Okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? A second. All those in favor? Okay. We will uh, hope to be back within five minutes. Let's thank you for your patience.
Okay, we're returning now to the open session for tonight's town council meeting. We did have a discussion with the town attorney uh, among the four of us on the council that are hearing this appeal. And the, uh, just the focus of the uh, interest of the council is almost exclusively on the provision uh, referenced in the introductory language to section 17-2-4 that refers to the, uh, the, the specific requirements for a driveway permit and all other local regulations. Uh, and, and Mr. Steer has raised with us uh, the, the issue of section 16-3-2 and whether the driveway permit uh, violated that section. Uh, we would like, the members of the council would like Mr. Steer, the appellant, to submit a written argument on that issue uh, and to do that within 10 days. Uh, and then we would ask the town uh, of Cape Elizabeth, uh, I'm not sure that maybe through Attorney Patricia Dunn, uh, to offer then a response within 10 days uh, so that we would have both the appellant and then the town's uh, written arguments in advance of our next a public meeting in January, Sarah, which is January 13th, because we don't want to belabor this or drag this on. And people may feel <laughs> that I've failed miserably at that, given the hour, but we would like to get you a decision uh, by the next town council meeting uh, so that folks know where this is going. Do you want a motion? And so what, what we're going to do then uh, is somebody's going to make a motion to table. That's going to end discussion, substantive discussion of this appeal tonight. And then we will uh, look forward to your submissions. Just, just, just yes. to clarify, it's the Director of Public Works, not the town. Y yes, I, I, it is the Director of Public Works, and that's why I was looking over at Attorney Patricia Dunn would be the one to handle this issue on behalf of the Director of Public Works. Mr. Leahy is here advising us as a council on how to deal with the appeal, so it wouldn't, in my view, be appropriate for him to be the one submitting the briefs. Do we have a motion, then? Sarah. Is everyone ready for me to table it? I was just going to say, did you want to s state out the um, specific items that you wanted addressed by the brief? I think our chair already did that. Okay. I'll set that. I move we table item number 17-2011 um, until January 13th. Our meeting on January 13th, 2011. I second. Okay, this is a motion to table, so we don't have any discussion at this point. All those in favor of the motion? Wait, uh, yeah. The motion carries. January 20th, 10th. January 10th. Okay. Could we amend the motion yeah. then? Sarah's at Monday. It's wrong. It's, it's wrong. <laughs> January 10th. Okay, with that, you would. I second the amended motion. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay, folks, I do apologize for the uh, <laughs> length that this took, but we do want to make sure we give as much thought and deliberation to all of these arguments. So thank you for coming tonight. Oh, could I just add one more thing, uh, folks? From, uh, if you come up to any of us in the IGA or on the street and ask us about anything that happened relating to this issue, we'll, we'll be polite and say thank you, but we cannot talk to you substantively about this since we are serving in a quasi-judicial role. So I just hope you understand that. Thank you. I think we just blow through this. Okay, uh, if folks, we actually have uh, about 20 more agenda items, so if you could clear out quickly, please, we, we do need to move forward. Okay, uh, it is 10.30 p.m., so we do need, if we're going to move forward and take up new, any of these agenda items, we're going to need a motion. Yes, Ann. Mr. Chairman, I um move that we suspend the rules so that we can proceed with new items after 10.30 p.m. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor? All right. Thank you. It's difficult to do all these things. Uh, 
uh, this late, but I believe we can motor through most of these, especially we have people here uh, who are waiting. So uh, item number 18-2011, Fort Williams Park Group Youth and Commercial Fees Proposal. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission is recommending revisions to existing fees at Fort Williams Park. Uh, yes. This is just updating the fees for the picnic shelter and for the other uh, small, the gazebo, the other small places of the park. They have reviewed them, and Ms. McCarthy, the chair of the committee, is here. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, did you want to offer anything in regard to this? Does anybody in the council have questions? Probably not, given the hour. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. All right, do we have a motion then? Anne. I move that we adopt the uh, proposed fee schedule. I second that. Okay, any discussion? Uh, I just want to make sure that Maureen takes the message back to the, because she has a meeting on Thursday night, that we appreciate the hard work of the advisory council. Because it's incredible. Because this, there have been more iterations around this whole thing and good discussion and I think very thoughtful recommendation being made here tonight. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion that's been seconded. All those in favor? And the motion carries unanimously. Item number 19-2011, the 2011 Beach to Beacon Road Race use of Fort Williams Park. Uh, I may just ask the town manager to uh, set this up for us. Uh, yes, David, happy to do so. I'm very pleased that we have an apparent uh, agreement with the Beach to Beacon organization, the TD, TD Beach to Beacon 10K Road Race, uh, on the a fee for the use of Fort Williams Park. Uh, the town council had asked us to be looked at. Uh, it's based not exactly, but <coughs> considering uh, the current group use policy, the current uh, fees for the, the, for the use of space. Uh, the Beach to Beacon uses the park beginning most years on Tuesday uh, with a very limited use of uh, different of the big fields and continues through until uh, Saturday, at, at which point uh, it, it actually everything disappears real, real quick. Uh, the recommended uh, fee is $25,000. Uh, in addition to that, the race will continue to pay all of the town's out-of-pocket expenses. So I'm pleased to present this to you and to recommend it to you. Okay. Move to accept. Okay, a motion's been made to accept this. It's been seconded. Any discussion? Any? I just want to say thank you to the Beach to, Beacon Organi Beach to Beacon Organizing Committee. It's a terrific event for the town, uh, one that we all look forward to every year. So thank you, uh, David, and the other folks. And as I've previously disclosed, I represent the town on the Beach to Beacon Organizing Committee and do want to uh, disclose that conflict as well. Any discussion or questions? Does that mean you need to recuse yourself? <laughs> Can I? No. I represent the town on that group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All those in favor of the motion? Okay. The motion carries unanimously. Thanks. And thank you for uh, staying with us so late. <clears throat> Item number... 20-2011 Perputic Club Annual Liquor Licenses. Uh, before we consider this uh, issue, I did want to disclose that I am a member of the Perputic Club, but I don't believe that has any impact on my ability to vote on this issue. Councillor? I also am a member, but I don't believe that I uh, need to recuse myself on this issue. Jessica? I'm also a member, but I don't believe I need to recuse myself on this issue. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sarah? I move we approve the annual liquor. We, we, I, I have to disclose that I'm also a member of the Purdue Club, <laughs> and I don't believe that it will in any way interfere with my decision. Okay. All the members disclose that? Okay. Sarah? As a non member, I, I, will make, member. I will make the, the motion. I move we approve the annual liquor and related licenses for the Purdue Club. I second Purdue. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded. Uh, we do have a representative of Purdue here. Thank you for coming out. I don't think we actually have any questions for you. No, that's great. Okay. <laughs> okay. All those in favor of the motion? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Item 21-2011, Recycling Center fees, proposal for those. Uh, and again, uh, Mike or Bob, do you want to set this up for us? Uh, thank you, uh, Council Chairman. The proposal before you is to amend the current fee schedule that we have at the Recycling Center 
to include uh, some items that previously have not been uh, uh, placed on that. Uh, the first one is microwave ovens. Uh, we currently do not list microwave ovens as being applicable to a fee. And as I look in my cover letter, I reference that uh, we do have to handle them. We do remove a capacitor that's in them, so there's some handling of the units. And we're proposing that that fee be $10 per unit. Uh, televisions, uh, we're getting, as I said in my memo, getting inundated with televisions lately. Not sure if it's because of the Christmas season, football season, or the pending <laughs> Super Bowl, but uh, we really were getting in a, a number of televisions. For this, <clears throat> for example, this past Saturday, we received 20, 21 televisions one day. So we have to handle those, we have to store them. We have a, a, a consolidator that comes every two weeks to pick them up. We have to physically place them in Gaylords on pallets and load them into the truck. So there is some handling. So we're proposing a fee for what we call console TVs, which are your traditional wooden cabinet console TVs, or a projection TV that might have a wooden enclosure around it. Anything else that has a plastic enclosure would be non-console. And I confirmed that definition with the folks at Riverside Recycling, so we'd be consistent in case someone went there and they said, geez, in Portland they charge this or they consider this. Um, so we did check with them to see what their definition was. And uh, on computers and monitors, we're proposing a $3 fee for all items. And, uh, right now, we have a relationship uh, with Goodwill Industries. Uh, they supply us uh, storage bins to put the monitors and computers in, but we have to place them in them. Uh, we have to bring them down from the swap shop if some get placed there. So it's really a handling fee. We don't have to pay for the disposal of them, but we do have to handle them. And finally, we're proposing a fee for carpeting, uh, rolls of carpet that go into our bulky waste container of uh, $15 per roll. So, happy to entertain any yes, questions. Just a quick question. What is the thought about all of these things that are now going to have fees being dumped in the swap shop? Well, that's always a challenge, regardless of what we have for fees. Currently, you know, just couches, chairs, bulky waste furniture, we find those in the swap shop. We find mattresses in the swap shop. That is, that's always a continuing challenge for us. Frank? Well, since uh, this is going to be public, and people are going to know that, uh, that uh, free riot ends December 31st, are you going to have people there to sort of police it between now and Most there? definitely. And um, also, um, these new prices that you're establishing, do, have you uh, been able to assess whether or not these actually do cover our costs? What I did was compare us to what Riverside Recycling was charging, so we'd be somewhat consistent. Mm -hmm. um, for example, on the microwaves, <coughs> Riverside Recycling charges $12. We were proposing 10 Riverside Recycling uh, charges $20 for a console TV. We're proposing 15 uh, They do charge 5 uh, for their uh, non-console tests. But looked at more, you know, if, if you look at what our handling time is, example, you know, for example, for the microwave ovens, you know, 15 minutes or so, plus or minus, they we're probably pretty close to covering our costs. Thank you. Hi, Ann. Um, yes, thank you. Bob, there was one other question. I had one change I noted on the first page of the chart um, in the top section. It said residential permit, and then right below it, it says commercial hauler permit, Cape Elizabeth based. Current fee, zero? That should, that, should actually, that should be $100. That's a typographical okay. error. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to uh, make sure. So that's, there's that's no change, change in there's that. There's no change there. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Do we have a motion? Sarah. I move we adopt the revised fees for the recycling centers proposed by the Director of Public Works. Second. Seconded. Any okay, motions have made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, item 22-2011, the Maine Department of Transportation response to our speed limit request on Route 77. Uh, the summary is here. Uh, understand that the state denied our request to, to reconsider the speed limit on the section of 77 that runs by Rudy's. 
uh, and that was uh, a request made in order to facilitate the installation of a crossbar, if I recall correctly, in connection with that application. Uh, Mike, is there anything further we need to know? No, I think you've covered it. We, we did try to prompt MDOT along the way to respond quicker, and uh, I think the dates speak for themselves. <laughs> so, so at this point, we need to accept the report and then pass it along to the planning board? To receive the report, yeah. Or uh, accept it, receive it. Uh, and I'd make motion to receive the report and to request that staff inform the planning board that MDOT has not made this change. So they will have to consider the impact on the crosswalk okay. requirement. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Frank. Do we have any, any avenue of appeals on this? <coughs> That's it? The new commissioner <laughs> uh, probably in a few weeks. So we have to resubmit it. <laughs> Any further questions? All right, all those in favor of the motion? Okay, motion carries. <clears throat> Item 23, 2011, and actually the next one, two, three, four items relate to the comprehensive plan implementation follow up. How do, does any, anyone have thoughts on how we, do we want to just take this one at a time, or sure. it would be quicker to go one at a time? Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, so item 23, 2011, comprehensive plan implementation follow-up. Uh, here we are, we are the memo, as the memo sets forth, we are being asked to consider affirming the vision state for the comprehensive plan. Uh, do we have a motion? Yeah. So moved. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, the motion carries. Uh, There's a problem with people here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, if anybody from the public would like to comment, uh, we are moving through very quickly, so I apologize. But if anybody from the public would like to comment on any of these agenda items, please just raise your hand. And if I'm looking down, somebody will kick me. So are you all set so far? Okay. Uh, comprehensive plan implementation follow-up regarding the planning board. This is item 24, 2011. We are, the recommendation is that we would send the memorandum that's in our materials to the planning board. Uh, Frank, do you want to set this up or? Well, basically that we, we've reset our priorities. We're asking the planning board to reset priorities <coughs> to focus on um, open space uh, before we look at land use and to um, and to basically take it in that order. And that the rest of the recommendation follows that, that pattern. OK. Would you like to make a motion then? Um, I move to um, recommend to send the, this memorandum to the planning board. Second. The okay, motion's been made and seconded. Anybody from the public wishing to comment? OK. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Carries unanimously. <coughs> Okay, item 25-2011, the comprehensive plan impl implementation follow-up, the proposed future open space preservation <coughs> committee. Uh, Frank or Jim, did you want to? Well, I, again, this in the, for, as a result of our, our work in the workshop and the ordinance committee, I mean, and also the spirit of communication and strategy and inclusion, this was an attempt. We're not for creating committees for the sake of doing so, but we felt that this was such an important issue and has an impact on the community for years to come that we felt that this would be a good cross-functional uh, way to go about uh, doing the work and getting soliciting input at every level and from different constituents in the community that have a vested interest in the, in the result. And there is a fairly extensive explanation of this in our materials uh, tonight. So would you be making a motion then to enforce yeah, I, that? Yeah, I so moved. Okay. Item 25-2011. I second. Any further discussion among the council? Public input? I have Sarah, a quick yes. comment. There are three <coughs> citizens who are going to be on this committee. I think it's going to be a really interesting committee. So for anyone who's still watching on TV, which is probably zero people, I would encourage <laughs> you to spread the word that um, the the Appointments Committee will be interviewing people, so please apply if you're interested. Yeah, good point. Thank you. And, I, and to, to back the point up, there's, and as what Jim also said, 
there's nothing more important for many people in town than um, issues dealing with open space. And the most, the only way this effort's going to um, come with a result that can be embraced broadly is that we get lots of public input on it and a lot of interest all along the way. So not only are the three citizens are going to be important elements of this, but um, active participation throughout the process we could get it done well. Jim. Um, this would be a question for Deb. Will we advertise for those three citizen? Um, I just wrote myself a note to check with Jessica as the uh, new chair of the Appointments Committee tomorrow um, to fill this in the Zoning Board and the Conservation Commission vacancies that we also have. So I'll attention based on Jessica. I'm sure it will be on the website, but I'm um, oh, just wondering how, how we Right. And actually, I, I already had a brief chat with uh, Deborah. Um, about this, but we're, we're waiting for tonight for the committee to be approved and so forth so that we can proceed. Okay, great. Yep. Great. All right. Uh, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Item 26 2011, Comprehensive Plan Implementation Follow up regarding the Ordinance Committee to Review Growth Areas. Again, in our, as a result of our workshops, and uh, we uh, are, have recommended that we would refer this to the Ordinance Committee to review the designated growth areas. So do I have a motion? So Frank? moved. So moved. And second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Public input? All right. All those in favor? The motion carries. Uh, Item 27-2011, easement relocation at 876 Shore Road. Um, this actually involves my mother, Beverly Sherman, so I am going to recuse myself. <laughs> with the, uh, uh, do we need a motion? I move that we um, allow <coughs> Councillor Sherman to, Chairman Sherman, to recuse himself on this issue. I second. I'll second it. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? All right. Uh, Sarah, would you be willing to? Uh... You bet. Thank you. Taking up. <laughs> Taking up item 27-2011, the easement relocation at 876 Shore Road. It's proposed to accept an easement for the relocation of draining, drainage infrastructure at 876 Shore Road. The easement is from Beverly M. Sherman and the Beverly M. Sherman Qualified Personal Residence Trust. Move to accept the easement. Second. I just want to thank Bob for all his efforts on this. Uh, it was a considerable amount of time uh, working with uh, the personal residence trust, and Mrs. Sherman and Mr. Sherman from time to time. So, thank you. Further discussion? All in favor? Thank you, Sarah. Um, item 28-2011, uh, annual acceptance of gifts. Uh, we are fortunate enough to receive gifts from uh, citizens in our community, and uh, we're being asked tonight to accept with appreciation those gifts. I don't know if, Mike, you want to give a, any more of a summary? I think you've covered it well. I want to thank Deborah for assembling the list. Do we have a motion? I so move. Second? Second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay. Item 29 2011, the community, community center space lease. Uh, Mike, could you bring us up to date on this? Yes, uh, Greg Marles, the school facilities director, has been working uh, trying to get this, the front building rented out. It's in front of the, the, the old house in front of the community center. Uh, Edward Jones uses some of it. Uh, a little bit of it was rented a month or two ago to Jamie Wagner. Uh, and this uh, 160 square feet, with, uh, which is very fairly limited space to Michael Moore. Uh, this means that the full rental income for that front building would be a little over 30,000 annually. So we're very pleased that we've got revenue coming in. The revenue from this all accrues to the community services budget. Okay. Do we have a motion? Move to authorize the lease with Michael Moore. 
Okay. Motion's been made seconded. and seconded. Any further discussion? Question I have. Yes, Frank. This might be more on the one and the same. <laughs> He's not an attorney. That's He's right. not an attorney? No, oh, yeah, he said it today. He wanted to make sure you knew that. Yeah. He's not. So what is he? Financial he, guy. Financial it could, I was told he was an attorney, and I, I'm a little bit nervous because I was told that. Did you have and we may have an exclusive with Edward Jones, so. Uh, well, his, his, his background is financial analysis. I'm not <coughs> sure what he's using this for. I don't think he'll be competing I, with Edward Jones. Yeah, I, should we uh, table this? Uh, well, he, I, I, Maybe he's trained as an attorney. It needs to be subject to right. subject that. to a confirmation that it doesn't conflict with the Edward Jones lease. Would you accept that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even though he's not a counselor. Yeah, I'll, I'll, accept, <laughs> I'll accept that amendment. <laughs> I was thinking it, though, so Mike was voicing what I was thinking. Uh, and who seconded the motion? Jim, what is that amendment? I uh, accept the amendment to the motion. Right. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Okay, the motion carries. <clears throat> Okay, item 30-2011, credit card payments for tax bills. Um, again, Mike, I would turn to you to... Yeah, this was today. one of the town council goals for the year is that we expand the use of credit cards. Uh, the state legislature passed a law, uh, this session that just ended uh, a few months ago, uh, saying that communities could accept credit cards and pass along the fees to the customers. You know, if, for, in, if, for example, if tax bills of 20% paid and we didn't pass the fee along, we could be stuck for an expense of about $140,000, which is quite a bit of money. Uh, what's particularly unique about the company we're dealing with uh, here, pros, included all the material, is that it's fully integrated with our tax billing and accounting system. Uh, so for that reason, uh, things such as, you know, we'll be able to send people tax bills uh, automatically by email so they'll get paperless tax bills if they prefer. Uh, it has the potential to save us some money in the long run. Uh, the fees, you know, they're not always the best, but they're, you've got to remember the difference between these fees and other fees is that they have to deal with each individual customer to perfect the collection instead of just dealing with us. It's not, it's not like they just need to deal with the town. If there's a problem with any, collect, with any collection, with any issue, uh, they'll need needing to be dealing with uh, all of the different customers. The, the fees are 40 cents for an EFP, an electronic funds transfer. Uh, the credit card is 2.95% of the value of the transaction. That can add up quickly. And if it's a Visa debit card, it's 395 per transaction. With no, Any questions? With no percentage applied on that, Mike? No percentage applied to the Visa debit card. Hmm. That's and I have a question for Mike. So is there... No miles. Mike. Oh. Is there a uh, what is is there a cost to the town? I see the costs to the people who are using it, but is there a cost? It, it, to there's the a town? small cost of uh, about twelve hundred dollars a year, I think. Yeah, fifty dollars a month. But then, if we add in other features, uh, which I think we would do, uh, it, it's about twelve hundred dollars a year. Okay, thank you. And and other there's also a work time involved with each morning making sure that, that everything reconciles and all of these automatic things end up with some staff work the next day. Right. I just wanted to make sure uh, I knew what the costs were. Jim. Uh, as, as more and more municipalities move to this as one more sort of service, if you will, yeah. and I know we have a particular re relationship with the company that we're using, is there a way to batch all this and get some lower cost? Um, in terms of the fees. Um, I mean, I, I typically have dealt with this transaction set. It, it's you're getting a 40 cent price point, and I've dealt with that at 32 cents. Yep. But that's because we're able to batch it into a larger group. And I'm just curious if there's any economies of scale through Maine Municipal or some other mm -hmm. possibility. That's all. I would, I would hope that we could in the long run. We are the, we're the very first community in the state of Maine to do this. Uh, with, with it all unified the way it is. Others have accepted credit cards. This is the first one that's totally unified uh, with the accounting system. Uh, so but I would hope that in the future, the, the, you, know, okay. you know, it's like everything, banking fees, the rest of it. Yeah. I, I hate to uh, predict 
any change because uh, yeah. you know, we just don't know. But we will look, you know, as time goes on, we'll look for uh, opportunities to aggregate the business. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions, Frank? Mike, how will the fee appear on people's bills? Will be um, one line item, including your tax, will be your separate fee? They'll be doing it online, uh -huh. and it, the fee will show up, and then there'll be a question Do you agree to this fee? Yes or no? They say yes. Do you wish, you know, and it'll be a sequential answer, a couple of questions, and submit, and pay, not too unlike if you ordered something online from L.O. Bean. And, you know, they had the shipping fees, and you've got to agree to that. Uh, this is the same thing. No, no one would pay these fees without specifically being disclosed. But some people are going to be shocked. A $10,000 uh, tax bill would be $295 fee. So uh, right. that could By the way, L.O. Bean has free shipping until the 20th of December. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you knew that. I, somebody back at L.L. Bean would be saying, how come you didn't correct the manager when he made that comment? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have, a, mo do do we have we, a motion on this yet? Do we need a motion on this, or is this just sort of an FYI? What's very important is you're establishing the policy that the fees are being passed along. Uh, you, you could accept credit cards and say, we'll pay the fees. This is establishing the policy for tax bills. The fees need to be okay. passed along. Okay. I, I move that we accept this system of credit card payments for tax bills as laid out in the materials presented to us tonight. Okay. Which has been made. Jessica? Second. I second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Item 31-2011, Riverside Cemetery Trustees Public Participation Process. The trustees of the cemetery have approved rules for the participation of the public at their meetings, and uh, we need to approve those rules in order for them to be effective. Is there anything else that we need to add? Do we have a motion? Jim. I move that we accept the uh, Riverside Cemetery trustees' public participation process again in the spirit of our communication policy. This is uh, another one of our goals from last year that we're seeing come to, uh, come to life. Okay. Second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion? Yeah, the motion carries. Okay, item number 32-2011 is actually uh, a property tax abatement request due to infirmity or poverty, which we will need to enter into executive session in order to consider. Uh, and I'm just trying to recall, do we typically at this point then take comments from folks? So if and, and, okay, so at this point, then I, there, we have our second opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. If you could just introduce yourself, sir, and state your address. Uh, Nelson Silva from 11 Old Colony Lane. And I just uh, have a question and a comment. It's regarding Shore Path, because there's a big push for uh, contributions and a lot of information going out there. Um, First of all, we did apply for PACS granting back in January. Has that been approved, disapproved, or where does that stand? We, 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 we applied for two different grants. Right. One was through the, what we call the PACS BTIP process, right. and one is through the Safe Route to Schools process. The PACS funding list of the, the bicycle and pedestrian project where this fell on, they funded two, we were third on the list. Okay. Uh, as you might have also read, there was $40,000 that they did set aside as part of a credit, but that, all the details of that still haven't worked out. The Safe Route to Schools grant, we, ex we expect an answer one way or the other sometime in the spring. Okay. Now, with the 40000 if we, you know, if it came to fruition, that came back to the town, would then we apply that uh, to, like, the, to the town center uh, bond issue from which we took $78,000? as part of the covering the expense for the f design planning surveying and and permitting applications because we've the town's basically paid out hundred and ten thousand yeah. dollars of taxpayer money towards that and this was supposed to be a no cost to the taxpayer it was going to be two hundred thousand through contributions and eight hundred plus thousand in grants to pay for the for the project let now we're up to 12,000, 12 percent of taxpayer uh, of the total cost has already been picked up by the taxpayers. 
Yeah, you, you let me. You had a couple of one okay. comment there that you Sorry. made that I just want to clarify sure. and answer the question. You, you said the project was at no cost to the taxpayers. The council did appropriate, <laughs> as you indicate, over 100,000. That is a cost to the taxpayers. Right, so but I mean, but the clarify. committee, the initial when this whole thing was first started, was based on the fact that it wasn't going to. It was a great deal for the town because it wasn't going to cost the town any money. It was going to come out of $200,000 in contributions and 800000 in grants if we got it. So thus far, it's, if, if, it comes, if everything comes to fruition, there will be 200000 in contributions, there will be the grants for 800000 but there's still 110000 that's already been paid by the taxpayer. Is that going to then be reimbursed into those there two accounts? I, mean, I, I guess the answer to your question is I don't know. Uh, the the town did appropriate. I was on the council at the time, the hundred and ten thousand for yep. the permitting, final design work, etc. Mm -hmm. How we would apply the forty thousand yeah. dollars through PACs, uh, I think, is going to have to be a decision made by the council at some future date. And there's limitations from PACs on how that money can be spent. It can only be spent for money that was applied for during the next biennium. The only project we have that we applied for during that biennium is the shore road path. Right. Okay. But, okay, because we also have the issue with the sidewalk that's not been finished. And I take it the reason it hasn't been finished because we didn't have the money. We've had, from what I understand, uh, we had, uh, we paid for or had enough money in the bond issue for the surveying design work and all of that, but not to build it. And my concern is, is that because 78,000 came out of that bond issue to go towards the, the town's $110,000 appropriation for the thing, and now that now we don't have the money to build the sidewalk, so now we're applying for another $40,000 grant from uh, MDOT community to build the sidewalk. That's yeah, the, the issue is way too complicated to explain at a little after okay. 11 o'clock, okay. particularly because you know, there, there were many different decisions made with the bond issue. But the, the operative town council policy right now is, as a vote, that a little over 100000 was applied and there were two grant applications that were authorized and that there was fundraising authorized. Beyond that, you know, at some point, the council may be revisiting some of the issues involving the Shore Road Path as opportunities and situations arise. You know, it's, it's tough to say, you know, every council is a little bit different. The times and circumstances are a little bit different. I can't say what the council is going to do four months from now, five months from now, six months from now. Different individual councils have said what they might do, but the council speaks when the council speaks. Okay. Uh, Anne? I, ju I just have one comment um, yeah. from uh, Mr. Silva um, mentioned that uh, there would be the talk of the council was that there would be no cost to the taxpayers. It's, m it's my recollection that um, the basis of most of the conversation that evening was that there would be no money paid for construction costs. There was a, a difference made between the, the permitting costs and construction costs. Well, so I just so wanted to clarify that right. for everybody okay. might be watching. No, it's not so much TV. with the council. It's, it's basically it's been the, uh, the advertisement from the very beginning when this all started with the, with, with the initial committee and with, the, and with the information that's out there in the papers and, and the emails that come from SAFE as far as for the contributions. It's always, it's a, you know, this is a win-win a, a for Kate because it's not costing the taxpayer any money. We're going to get 200000 in donations and we get the 800000 in grants and, you know, and it's a free ride to the, to the town. And, and it really isn't if that's the case. But thank you again for your time. Appreciate thank, it. thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other citizens wishing to comment? Okay. Uh, upcoming meet. Uh, see, we also do we need do we need to acknowledge the financial reports or miscellaneous letters we've received them. Upcoming meetings uh, January is, is January 10th, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, the workshop is scheduled for January 3rd. We'll, we'll be discussing our goals for the year and also meeting with our state legislat legislators, all of whom have agreed to come, which is very nice of them. Anything else before we adjourn into a, an executive session? And we will be taking our vote in public, I presume, even though the cameras will be off, we will come out of our executive session and vote in public. That's right.
I do I have a motion? I move so that we uh, go into the executive session to address the uh, item number 32201. Thank you, Lillian. A motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lillian. Great.